It was Christmas Eve of 2014 at about 8 o'clock p.m. I was driving to my boss's house to drop off a set of keys when an orange orb flew over my car. I immediately pulled over to the side and got out of the car and looked up to see a dozen orange orbs the size of cantaloupes. They were five to ten feet above me. They seemed to have heartbeats and would control their brightness, pulsing. I was trying to see if they were solid, but they weren't, which was odd because they were definitely intelligent. They were completely silent and seemed to have their own personalities. Some stood still, while others whizzed by playfully. When I would stare at one, it would blink, I guess to let me know that it saw me. I wasn't scared. I was actually euphoric and very excited to be a witness to this. They seemed friendly to me. I watched them for about three to five minutes until they slowly flew away and each one disappeared. I was amazed and I even stopped at a church that was close by to ask if anybody had seen these things. They said no. To this day, it was one of the most bizarre and profound experiences of my life. Also, the next day, my eyes were burning red and sore. I later found out that there were many other sightings all over the US on the same night. When I was about seven years old, my mom was at work and my dad was watching me. I was an only child and I didn't have any friends over at the time. I'm pretty sure my dad and I were playing with Barbies when we both heard two children laughing. Nothing malicious, just playful. Then, all of a sudden, we hear a loud thud coming from my bedroom. Naturally, my dad and I went to go check it out. All of the stuffed animals that I had on the bottom bunk were on the floor. I had a bunk bed, but the entire twin mattress wall was filled to the brim with stuffed animals. Every one was on the floor. Nothing could explain how they had fallen, other than perhaps the children we heard laughing seconds before had pushed them off. I had many experiences with the paranormal. We did live close to a funeral home and a cemetery. And this was just one of many things that happened when we lived there. But it's still one of my favorite stories. Traveling back to Seattle through Olympic National Forest, Redditor Angry111 pulled over to photograph the forest. What they saw as they turned to leave will haunt them for the rest of their lives. This is their story. Last night, I was returning to Seattle after visiting Forks. Along the way, I passed through Olympic National Forest. It was incredibly dark, snowing a ton, and as I was about 50 miles from Forks in the direction of the Ho Rainforest, I was in the darkest part of the forest. Perhaps I should have just driven straight through, but the pines are absolutely gorgeous this time of year, and, not one to be deterred from a good nature shot, I decided to pull over. Yes, it was dark, but my phone has a night mode, and I figured this would be as good a time as any to put it to the test. I took some photos and then lowered my phone. As I did, however, I noticed something crouched on a stump. The figure was that of an extremely tall and skinny humanoid figure, with long arms that hung down in front of it, too long to be a person's. The thing was stark white and stood out drastically against the backdrop of pines and winter night. What chilled me to the bone, though, was that it had no eyes. Suffice it to say, I quickly re-entered my car and took off, content to get home in one piece and without having any unnecessary encounters with whatever that thing was. I only saw it for a moment, 
but if you ask me, it was a moment too long. I can't explain what I saw, and maybe it's better that way. I was about seven years old, my brother about 10. It was well past our bedtime when our mom woke up off the couch to put us to bed. Our dad worked construction out of town back then, so it was often just us three at the house for weeks at a time. Up the stairs and to the immediate right was our parents' bedroom. Going left put you in the middle of a hallway. Taking another left down that hallway led to my brother's room. The opposite end was my room, which was also across the hall from our upstairs bathroom. At either end of the hallway are windowed doors that we always kept locked and rarely used. The door on my end led to a balcony overlooking our front yard, and the door on my brother's end opened to our back porch. The house kind of leans into a small hill. My brother and mom both had a habit of waking up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom. I only knew this because I was always a light sleeper and they just couldn't help flushing with the door wide open. This night, however, my brother stopped on his way to his room and came back toward the bathroom. He said, I'm gonna try to pee before I go to bed. The past few nights I've been too afraid to walk to the bathroom I keep seeing a man in stripes at the end of the hall. I don't know if my mom wrote it off as my brother telling ghost stories to try to scare me, or if she was already half asleep and didn't catch it, but she didn't react at all to my brother's confession. I, on the other hand, was terrified by it. The fear of seeing a ghost like that at the end of the hallway or through the window is the reason I started running from the stairs to my bedroom at night. Years later, when I was about 18, my mom and I were having a conversation in her car about a dog that we had for a very short time when I was little. We were sharing stories about Max's tendency toward destroying my shoes and other unruly behaviors. When my mom blurted out, do you remember that time I opened the front door for the cops and Max ran inside to the kitchen and started tearing open that big bag of dog food we had? This really caught me by surprise, because in all the years I lived in that house, we never once called the cops. We were a gun-owning family in a quiet, rural West Virginia neighborhood, and also nothing had ever really happened that would have required home defense, let alone the cops. I asked her what she was talking about, and she looked equally surprised, as if she had just revealed something by accident. Oh, that's right, she said. I never told you because you were too young at the time. Okay, so one night I woke up hearing noises outside my window. And when I looked, I saw a man staring into my bedroom. She went on to describe how turning on the lights caused him to take off running and how she grabbed my dad's pistol before calling the cops. I can't remember all the details I gave them when they showed up, but he was a tall white male wearing a striped shirt and jeans and short dark hair. Something like that, she said. They said it matched the description of a man they were looking for in the area. Turns out he had escaped from jail on a murder charge. Now, I know it sounds so obvious hearing those two stories back to back, but this was years apart. And honestly, it wasn't until a few years ago, in my mid-twenties, that I pieced together that my brother had unknowingly warned us about a murderer who spent multiple nights casing our home while we thought he was telling ghost stories. I'd like to preface this particular event that happened to me in my youth by saying that I've experienced far more paranormal activity, looking back, than I had ever really taken the time to consider. That being said, 
I have more stories that I might share in the future. But for this one, I want to tell you about the strange woods of Maine. As a child growing up in the backwoods of Maine, I've heard my fair share of strange things in the night. Typically, it'll be coyotes hunting, or the prowl of another nocturnal creature. As a child, I was never particularly afraid of the dark, but I knew dangers lurked in the absence of light. So at night, I played indoors. During the daytime, however, there were never any restrictions. On one summer afternoon, I was riding my bike down the street that branched off my dead-end road. Our only neighbors were a relative and a couple of decent folks just down the way. Otherwise, quiet woods. I would make this ride quite often, as there was no town, but this stretch was fun to ride because I could pedal my heart out without having to slow down in order to veer. On this day, I made my normal round up the road, only to turn around and head back. I had an uneasy feeling on the ride up, which was the only abnormality. I felt like I was being watched. Something told me to look toward the woods on my right, and reluctantly, I did so. Deep in the woods, amongst the pines, I saw a black, almost liquid thing peer out from behind a tree. My heart dropped. I took off pedaling as fast as my feet would take me, keeping a steady eye on the woods to my right. This thing kept pace effortlessly, darting from tree to tree like some primordial ooze. It was either playing or stalking prey, and I wasn't about to stop and find out which. I was pedaling so hard I thought my chain would snap. I knew my uncle's house was approaching on the left. I spun out in the dirt, ditched the bike, and ran to his door, frantically knocking. I turned around to see if whatever it was would be making its way toward me but I didn't see anything. My uncle opened the door, cigarette in his mouth, asking me what was wrong. I explained to him what I saw, but he grabbed a rifle and said, probably just a bear, with slight concern in his voice. I've never seen a bear move like that, I said, out of breath. Yep, he said, they'll do that. He peered through the blinds. To this day, I don't know what I saw, but something tells me my uncle sure did. It's been 20 years, and I've since lost contact with my uncle. Maybe someday, I'll reach out and ask. I lived in a 1900 farmhouse in northern Maine, along the border of Canada. The house was a small two-story clapboard-sided farmhouse. The central heat was a giant handcrafted metal stove. It was large enough to fit a log a foot in diameter and three feet long, and sat in the middle of the dirt-floored basement. The stove was so airtight that you could throw in several chunks of split hardwood and dog it down tight. Then you crack the air vent just a tiny bit and the fire would smolder all night with heat drifting up through the vents and ducts. It was the main heat source in the house, although there were two additional cast iron wood stoves. I lived there with my father and his girlfriend. My father would spend a lot of time working on the property, clearing brush. He also worked on scraping the peeling paint and applying a fresh new coat. Although he refused to invest money in the house, so many of his repairs were low quality and incomplete. After I moved away, I stayed away for over 15 years. One day, my wife and I were staying at a hotel a few hours away and found ourselves with a free day to randomly explore. We ended up driving back to the area of that house and decided to make it our destination. The area hadn't changed much. The area is very sparse, 
with a lot of dense trees and large grassy yards and fields, farms here and there. We turned off US Highway 1 onto the road named Wilcox Settlement Road. The house was maybe a quarter mile down that road. The sun was low in the late afternoon sky, a bit above the trees. I pulled up at the end of the driveway, or dooryard as the locals call it, and stopped in the road. The house was a wreck, in much worse shape than when my father had owned it. There were a few beat up cars parked by the house. There were barrels and scrap wood and random old junk all around the yard and on the porch. Much of the siding had been removed, exposing mylar-backed foam insulation boards that had been pressed between the studs in the exterior wall. There was an old, dented, rusty pickup truck parked closest to the road where we sat idling. My foot on the brake, my wife and I sat gaping at the creepy old dilapidated house. The yard was overgrown, and the brush had reclaimed most of what my father had laboriously cleared all those years ago. Movement caught my eye in the dimming light. A waving hand. There was a man standing on the other side of the old pickup truck, and he was slowly waving his arm, beckoning us toward him. He was a large, overweight man, late thirties to mid forties, dressed in a dirty work coat. His mouth was open in a gap-toothed smile, and he stood there, still, except for his upraised right arm, slowly beckoning us to pull into the driveway. I was frightened. First of all, we didn't see him initially, so it caught us off guard to have him standing as close as he was. Secondly, the way he stood there, watching us, beckoning, reminded me of a scene from a backwoods horror film. The man's smile seemed to me a cunning veneer of harmlessness, belied by a bleary, cold glint of greed, or worse. I instinctively floored the accelerator and sped away. I hate that house. It was a very bad place. I felt like it was stained with bleak sadness, fear, and loneliness. This happened back in 2019, around November 2nd, if I remember correctly. This story is 100% true, although I'm still unsure if it was just a coincidence or what. But anyway, this is what happened. Back in 2019, I was pretty much depressed the whole year. I wasn't planning on doing anything, I just didn't care as much about my well-being. I stopped wearing a seatbelt. I didn't care if I lived or died. It wasn't that I wanted to do either. I just was apathetic. Due to this depression and things getting worse for me mentally at the time, I did a lot of really dumb things in the supernatural realm. I've always known not to speak to the dead, knowing that when you speak to one spirit, the rest can hear you as well. I've always been extremely superstitious and I believe in the paranormal and supernatural a thousand percent. Anyway, I live next to a huge cemetery, and I drive by it every day since it's right across from my neighborhood. Due to my superstitions and believing that the dead can do things us humans aren't quite capable of, each day I would scream out of the window when passing the cemetery, begging one of the spirits to, shall we say, bring me to their side. This habit started on November 2nd, I believe. So I did that each day while driving past the cemetery. Lo and behold, on November 6th, I was driving to work at about 4.30 in the morning. I go the same way every single day. I was coming up on a red light. Out of nowhere, and I kid you not, this was literally out of nowhere. I hear this loud honk from behind me and I was rear-ended by one of those big white RG&E trucks. You know, the ones that fix telephone poles and stuff? Since I was at the red light, it basically pushed my car forward into the middle of the intersection. And once again out of nowhere, 
I was T-boned by some random man in a van with his wife. I was driving an 05 Nissan Sentra at the time, and it was completely wrecked. Literally demolished. But I had not one scratch on me at all. My knees were extremely bruised. I have no idea how that happened, but that was pretty much it. This also happened literally on the main road coming out of my neighborhood, about a mile down from the cemetery. And there are never cars this early in the morning. Maybe one, but even that's rare for the most part. While I was talking to the old man, they live in a town 40 minutes away, and they were driving to the park at 4.30 in the morning? The whole story is so weird, and it honestly kind of creeps me out, especially because one of the things I kept yelling was to get me in a car accident. It was an extremely bad financial situation for me at the time, and I was stuck without a car for quite some time. I think perhaps the cemetery or the spirits within it were maybe giving me what I asked for, but not what I asked for. Maybe they just wanted to wake me up and help me appreciate life again. Or maybe it was just a completely weird coincidence. Take it for what you will, but it was an extremely weird thing. So I'm walking to my new job at FedEx, and I didn't realize that I had to walk past a cemetery. Mind you, my shift is from 4 a.m. to 9 a.m. I've walked past many cemeteries in my life, so I wasn't too concerned at first. I had a pretty lit up highway on my left, and on my right was a large cemetery. No cars, no people, just me. As I kept walking, I started feeling uneasy about the vibes. It wasn't fear, nor was I scared, but it was dreadfulness and sadness overall. And to make matters worse, I didn't realize that it was 3 a.m. at the time. I tried to look straight ahead and not acknowledge the fact that I had a cemetery six feet away from me, just engulfed in complete darkness, but I couldn't. And I can't explain really what I felt, but it was just awful, like a heavy feeling of sadness, but it felt cold. After walking for 20 straight minutes and realizing I had another 15 to go, I decided to just go back home. As I started walking back, I started hearing the grass rustling as if somebody was following me. Honestly, I think my mind was playing tricks but the whole time, I felt like I was being watched. I've had a good amount of paranormal encounters in my life, so I'm familiar with this feeling, but I just felt so afraid at that point. I just wanted to share this experience because it kind of had me distressed, and I'm just curious to see if anybody else has had a similar experience. Redditor OK Armadillo 3754 went out on a two-week trip through Washington with his girlfriend. They decided not to plan anything and just see where the trip took them. They got a little bit more of the unplanned than they bargained for. This is their story. A couple of years ago, my girlfriend and I decided to take a two-week trip to Washington State. One of the main goals of our trip was to plan virtually nothing. We wanted to take off, let adventure guide us, stop when we saw something cool, and go back home when it was time. So that's what we did. We started out and just made it up as we went along. It was incredible. First we visited Yakima, Washington. Then we traveled over to Seattle, wandered through Olympia, explored Bremerton, and eventually made it to Forks. At this point, we decided to go to the Ho Rainforest, which is one of the largest temperate rainforests in the United States. 
After we'd been there for a while, wandering through in the car, we realized we'd somehow gotten lost. In fact, we were about 20 miles off track, and we ended up in what looked like a tree logging operation. Everywhere we looked, we saw these wide open sections with tree stumps as far as the eye could see. Traveling through this area, the sun began to set. I can't remember exactly what time of day it was when we saw it, but off in the distance, maybe 100 to 125 yards, I saw movement. Whatever it was, it was moving quite fast, and that intrigued me. I slowed down the car and kept my eyes on the figure, trying to see what it was. At first, I thought it was just a bear. Then, as it passed through a cleared area, I realized something that made my hair stand on end. It was running on its hind legs. I watched for about 15 seconds before this thing finally disappeared into the forest. Whatever it was, it was going at least 30 miles per hour on its hind legs, over quite a distance. I have no explanation for what we saw, but whatever it was, it was no bear. I've always been in tune with the paranormal since I was a little girl. My relatives tell me that I played hide-and-seek with my great-grandfather, two months after his passing. Unbeknownst to me, I was too little to understand death. Besides having contacts with the deceased throughout my life, I've also experienced prophetic dreams multiple times a week, mostly of ordinary events, like dreaming of having a conversation with my mother, and then having it play out a couple of weeks later exactly as I dreamed. Some of my other family members also share some particularities. My mother has foreseen pregnancies and cancers, and my cousin always dreams of people before meeting them. I considered all of this somewhat different, but not completely out of the ordinary. I never thought anything of it, except having the constant deja vu passing through me like a shockwave from events that play out exactly like in my dreams. Until one day, it all changed. And before I start, I would just like to say that this story is 100% true, and to this day, I don't know the complete truth behind it. In September of 2018, I saw a moth. Nothing unusual, just a regular moth that landed on my desk while I was studying for university. It was the most ordinary moth you could imagine, and I thought nothing of it until three days later, when I saw another one. Again, a regular moth with no distinguishable features just happened to enter my room and stay on the wall. And then again, a couple days later, I saw another one land close to me at the university. I would be walking on the street and see moths everywhere. Before September of 2018, I had seen maybe five moths in my entire life. And then all of a sudden, I saw five in one week. If it was only happening in my bedroom, I would assume something logical was going on. But they always seemed to follow me everywhere and land close to me, even at random places like the DMV. After a month of this madness, I had a random conversation with my grandmother about something completely unrelated. That's when she mentioned that her deceased mother-in-law, my great-grandmother, was a witch. Not a regular witch, but black magic type of witch. Now, my grandmother is not completely trustworthy since she does exaggerate absolutely everything she says. It could very well have been that she just had some incense and candles and my grandmother said she was sacrificing chickens to the devil or something. I was never able to figure out the truth of it since nobody in my family speaks of it. And the one person that does is not a completely reliable witness. But true or not, I started looking into witchcraft and paganism after this conversation, and I came across the symbolism of moths. One of them is spiritual transformation. And then it clicked in my head that maybe, just maybe, 
Someone was trying to reach out to me, to guide me, to get me to research, to tell me that this is what my spiritual path is supposed to be. Maybe it was my great-grandmother trying to hold my hand and steer me in the right direction. Maybe you believe this and maybe you don't. All I know is that after this realization, the moths stopped. I went back to seeing them on a normal, regular basis. And when I do, I always greet them like old friends and I thank them for the message. A few friends of mine were into exploring abandoned places and checking locations out. Whether it's a rundown shack in the middle of nowhere or an abandoned building, we were always eager to take a look around. To be clear, we don't vandalize or destroy property, we just go take a look. One day, I find out that one of the cemeteries in my area is apparently haunted. It borders on an old abandoned mental hospital and the cemetery was the burial ground for some of the unfortunates who died at that place. The asylum is 150 years old, and it was a horrible place for those who were housed there. All up, there were four of us. After 20 minutes of driving, we get out and search for this cemetery. After about 10 to 15 minutes of looking on maps and walking up and down the neighborhood, we finally came across the cemetery's entrance. It was around 11 p.m. when we got to the cemetery. It was very quiet, barely any cars on the street, and all I could hear was the distant dogs yapping about. All four of us start heading into the cemetery. We're taking this slow and using our eyes and ears to catch anything suspicious. As we're walking, I hear a faint laugh coming from the trees below. It sounded like a child. I first wrote it off as a dog barking in the distance or just something explainable. As we continue down the track farther, I hear the child laughter again. I turn to my friend, who turns to me, and we both just stare at each other. We both heard the same thing coming from the woods below and were just spooked. But that didn't stop us. We pushed on, going farther into the cemetery and toward the trees. We eventually ended up getting too scared and decided to turn around and walk back. I was positioned with another friend of mine, about two meters behind my other buddies. All of a sudden, I can hear heavy footsteps walking toward us to our right. I'm not kidding when I say this. These footsteps just started picking up pace and we could hear these loud thumping steps just galloping at us. We panicked like crazy because we were looking directly toward this sound and nobody was there. It was too loud to be some kind of critter and it definitely wasn't another person. I'm older now and I no longer explore urban places or abandoned places. It's too risky and I don't want to get fined, but I still can't find a logical explanation for whatever it was that we experienced that night. While on vacation in Japan last year, I stayed at an Airbnb near the Daigo Shrine in Kyoto. On my last night in town, I came back to my Airbnb at about 11.40 p.m. on a Monday night. Mind you, I had no alcohol or drugs in my system when this happened, and I was wide awake. There's a shrine that you have to walk past on a walkway that goes to and from the Airbnb to other areas of town. It was three city blocks long by two blocks going both sides. As the layout goes, there were ditches at the foot of the walls, followed by a row of plants alternating all the way down, and then there was a walkway in the middle, with a museum on the right, a whole shrine and palace at the fork. I walk into the walkway of the shrine and I ask myself this question, why are there two kids hopping a wall? As I see these two little figures hop the wall to my right, 
I pause and watch what's happening. As they both get down, they run across the path and run all the way to the end of the path by the fork and wait there. I was walking single file. They stand there for a few minutes. I walk a little closer because that was the way to the Airbnb, and I make eye contact with these things. They were about three to four feet tall, very slim but proportionate, with a bigger head and pointed ears, as white as snow. Their eyes were as big as our eye sockets, but black. Normally you can tell if someone is wearing clothes at a small distance. I was maybe 15 to 20 yards from them, but they had no sign of clothing. After making eye contact, both of them go running around the corner that I had to turn. You could also see their shadows on the walls behind them. But I slowed down to give these things space. I was freaking out a little bit at this point. As I turned the corner, they were gone. I'm walking back to my Airbnb and I sensed that I was being followed, but I couldn't hear or see anything. I have no idea what I saw. Aliens? Something else? I don't know. When this Redditor was traveling through Valley Forge National Park, they decided to pull over to capture the gorgeous moon. What happened next was an experience they've not yet forgotten. Here's the story. Sometime last year, we experienced a unique lunar event. I believe it was called the Super Blood Moon, but whatever it was called, it was absolutely enormous. It lit up the sky was larger than any moon I had ever seen before, and it was beautiful. During this event, I was traveling through Valley Forge National Park at about 9 o'clock at night. Admiring the moon, I decided I wanted to take a picture of it, if I could do so safely. Fortunately, up on my right, I saw a parking area that still had its gate open. I pulled in so as to be safely out of the road, but only so far. I didn't want to go all the way into the lot for some reason. I stopped my car, exited the vehicle, and pulled out my phone. Kneeling down, I began to set up for my shot. The moon in view, I lifted my finger to take the photo and stopped. Every hair on the back of my neck was standing on end. Without warning and seemingly without reason, I felt an intense feeling of dread come over me. I felt as though a crowd of people was pressing in on every side, inching ever closer to me, some close enough to reach out and touch me. I closed my eyes for a moment and then turned around. Nothing. Facing the blackness did nothing to calm my nerves, though. In fact, seeing no visible reason for my fear only intensified it. Something in me felt as though I had pinpointed the source. I just couldn't see it. Not wanting to miss my chance to catch a photo of this beautiful moon, though, I turned around to face the camera once more. My hands shook, and I said into the night, I just want to take a picture of the moon, and then I'll be leaving, I promise. After saying this, I felt a slight reprieve in the oppressive feeling and took two photos. Neither was in focus, though, and at that point I was so terrified that all I could think of was leaving. Cutting my losses on the shot, I took my phone and tripod, my two blurry photos, and scrambled to get back into the car. Throwing the car in reverse, I got out of that area as fast as I could. To this day, I have never stopped there again at night, and I don't intend to. There's an old wives' tale about this stretch of road in Maine, Route 182, a.k.a. Blackswoods Road. 
It's home to Catherine, the ghost hitchhiker, and the devil truck. I am still shaken to my very core by the experience I had five years ago. The story of Catherine I won't really comment on. There are lots of accounts of that. They even made episodes on shows about it. But what I'm going to talk about is much darker. The devil truck. This truck isn't talked about much, except by old timers at the gas station called Tideway. When they first told me about it, I didn't believe it. Boy, I wish I would have before I left the store that night. But anyway, I thought, great, old timers telling me some BS because I just moved here. I should add that at this time, I was a fresh deputy with Waldo County. So I grabbed an orange juice out of the cooler because they didn't have the Gatorade I liked, told the old timers I was going to head home because I had a long day shift, paid for my drink, and left. Here's the creepy part. I live on 182. So I started driving home normally in my take-home vehicle. I pulled out of the gas station and sped off. I set the cruise control and the charger to 50 miles per hour and just started thinking about what I wanted for supper. About three miles after the gas station, a truck pulls out behind me. I didn't think much of it. Except that it was weird to see a 72 F-100 out on the roads this late. Then out of nowhere, about 25 minutes after pulling out behind me, the truck rams the back of the cruiser, sending me sideways. I remember slamming into a tree and spinning back across the road into the guardrail that separates the road from Fox Pond. I instantly put on my blues so traffic would see me since my headlights were facing right where the blind spot was on the road. I got out looking for the truck, thinking it had to be a problem with the truck. Surely somebody wouldn't try to kill a sheriff's deputy in Maine. There was no truck. There wasn't even a sign of a truck. I tried to call it in, but my car radio wouldn't work. Luckily, one of the old timers from the store was traveling home as well and stopped to help. What he said to me haunts me every time I drive that road at night. Must have been going fast. Devil Truck doesn't like speeders. After he said that, I went to look at the tree that I hit and saw a speed limit sign that somebody must have ripped out. It was lying right about the point of impact where the truck had hit me. Speed limit 45. Sure enough, I was speeding. And I guess the devil truck didn't like it. This is the story of Madeline, the doll that has my face. For context, my mom is the original owner of Madeline. But Madeline has been mine since I was a child. Madeline was bought by my mother about 35 years ago, long before I was born. There's a possibility that she's a lot older than that, as she was second hand when my mom bought her. These are my experiences with this doll. I'm well aware that creepy doll is a trope, but stay with me. Madeline, I named her, is a porcelain doll with a soft body filled of horse hair with her hands and feet and face made of plain white porcelain. Her hair, according to a doll expert I had her repaired by a few years ago, is a combination of horse and human. She's about 30 centimeters long, with brown hair, blue eyes, wears a blue cotton dress with embellishments, black leather lace-up boots, and a somewhat Victorian underdress. I believe she was pretty common, a generic doll type, I base this off the fact that I took her to doll shows as a child to find out a little bit more about her, since she doesn't have any marks, and another lady had her almost exact identical replica. Same dress, same colors, hair, and everything, so she must have been pretty common. The only difference? The face. The lady and I compared the dolls, vividly pointing out how my doll's face was almost identical to mine. 
I'm not saying it's impossible to have dolls who look somewhat similar to you. I mean, that's just good marketing, really. But at the time, I had a jaw problem that required surgery, and the doll's jaw perfectly matched mine. Heavy overbite. This lady's doll didn't at all. Given the dolls had everything else exactly the same except the face, it just sort of makes me wonder if at some point her face had been replaced or repainted before my mom purchased her. I don't believe Madeline to be a harmful entity, but a few strange things have happened that make me wonder. As a child, I kept her on my bed on the top bunk. I had one of those loft beds with a desk under it while I was at school. If someone was to change the sheets, they'd put her back because mom was always worried that the dog would eat her. She was always on my bed and I was the only kid in the house, so I'm the only one who played with her at the time. At school one day, I would have been about 10 years old, I broke my right wrist. Most children will break something in childhood and I had fallen out of a tree. I remember getting home from the hospital at about 8 p.m. and I was a bit dopey from the assistance they'd given me. Because I couldn't climb the bunk in a cast, Mom made me up the mattress on the ground. I had grabbed Madeline so that Mom could move the bed, when suddenly, Madeline's right hand dropped onto the carpet. I would brush this off, but more has happened. Once I needed stitches in my head. I came home and there was a chunk of Madeline's hair gone. I had jaw correction surgery. Now neither of us have an overbite. I've had knee surgery and have a scar on my right foot and she has just had a crack repaired on her right foot. Mom, who hadn't seen her in a few years, as I've had things in storage, recently made a comment, and it's what made me decide to tell my story. She said, I remember her having a much younger looking face when you were little. Could this doll be aging with me, experiencing things like I am? I really don't know what it means, but I'm interested to hear your thoughts. My dad grew up in the 70s in a wooded area in Maine. It was a tiny neighborhood with woods surrounding the outer part. My dad had all sorts of unexplained activity in his mother's house, but this is the one that stuck with me. My dad was around nine or 10. He couldn't sleep. Right beside his bed was a window and he could easily look out it from his bed. He heard noises outside and he got excited because he thought it was a moose or some wild animal. So he whipped open the shade. There was no moose. Looking back at my father was a little boy his age, maybe a little bit younger. He wasn't sure exactly what he was seeing. It was very foggy, but it was undeniable that he was looking at a little boy, a little redhead boy with overalls on and one of those stupid propeller hats. My dad wanted to close the shade and pretend that he had never seen him, but he just could not look away. The boy smiled and waved and began to walk away, becoming harder for my dad to see. Eventually, the boy disappeared into the fog. It was dark and there was this thick fog. It was easy for my dad to convince himself that he imagined the whole thing. I think little kids find it easier to convince themselves that nothing has happened, that they just have an overactive imagination. I mean, that's what adults always tell children anyway. My dad was over at a friend's house a few days later. They were outside shooting BB guns, normal kids in the 70s, freedom type playing. The friend's dad was working on a car. My dad tells his friend this story, thinking that they would both laugh at how silly my dad was. My dad told the friend, but he didn't laugh. His eyes got wide and all the color drained from his face. 
The friend books it over to his dad. My dad panics a little bit, thinking that his friend was telling his dad that he was trying to scare him and that my dad would get in trouble for it. Instead, the boy runs up to his dad and says, Dad, Dad, he saw the boy with the funny hat too. In the summer, my parents rented an Airbnb in Holton, Maine. It was a very old farmhouse, but it was recently renovated. The fields and sunsets were beautiful. I always felt like something was watching me. It wasn't a bad feeling, though. We celebrated my birthday there, and that night I had a crazy dream. A woman named Gladys introduced herself to me and told me that this was her home. She told me she loved having my family and I there. She said that she never wanted us to leave. She also said that our birthdays are very close together as well. In the dream, Gladys and I played a board game and talked about so much, her past, her family, things like that. I tried so hard not to Google her name and see what came up until after I left to go home. But my curiosity got the best of me. Turns out there was an old woman named Gladys who lived there and died about a year earlier. Her birthday was August 10th, and mine is August 7th. The picture that was in her obituary looked exactly like the woman that I saw in the dream. That's how I know that it was her. I'm currently visiting York, Maine for a family reunion. We're renting a house about a mile from the Nubble Lighthouse, if anyone cares to look up the location. This house has a wraparound porch with a front door and a side door right before the porch ends and the stairs lead to the backyard. The side door has a very recognizable sound. It almost sounds like somebody passing gas. We joked about it the first night there. The front door creaks like any other old door and slams on the frame. You can hear the wood, then the rubber liner on the door squeeze shut against the frame. Anyway, the first night we got settled in, we all went up to bed around midnight. It's a three-bedroom house with very thin walls. You can hear conversations happening in the kitchen from the upstairs bedrooms, and every floorboard creaks with any movement. My mom and dad went up to bed first, followed by my brother, my girlfriend and I followed about 15 minutes later. The other night, I'm upstairs in my room waiting for my girlfriend to get out of the bathroom. I hear a creak and a slam from downstairs, and the vibration through the house of a door hitting the frame. At first I thought it was my dad coming in from a smoke, but I listened and I could hear him snoring in his bedroom. Once my girlfriend got back, I asked her if she dropped anything. She said that she hadn't, but she thought I had fallen off the bed or something because the noise was so loud and shook the house. Kind of creepy, but I didn't think much of it again until last night. Around 12.30 to 1 in the morning, the same door creak and slam noise occurred at roughly the same time. And after this second time, keeping me wide awake, I decided to ask the rest of my family if they were up and about in the middle of the night. My parents deny walking around downstairs, and my brother then tells me he's been sleeping with his light on every night since the very first, because he would hear soft footsteps and feel a presence standing at the back of his room. We're going to have a quieter evening tonight and keep an ear to the downstairs area before bed to see if we hear anything else. I'm also considering laying in my brother's room in the dark to see if I hear or feel anything out of the ordinary. 
If anybody has any experience with this and may know how to stimulate more action, please let me know. I love paranormal things, but up to this point in my life, this is the closest I've ever been to experiencing any. I wish I had more to the story, but this is what we've been going through so far. One of my favorite pastimes is walking through and exploring cemeteries. I went to one that I've been to before, but due to its size, multiple trips had to be taken to explore all of it. I came across a grave with no name, no dates, nothing, except for forever in our hearts written on it. I hadn't really seen a grave with no name or date, so I stepped down to take a closer look at it. It was decorated with a pinwheel and a really old dead bouquet of flowers. There were other graves around it with some pinwheels as well. But when I stepped down to look at it, the pinwheel instantly started spinning. I didn't think much of it at first, until I backed off of it and it completely stopped as soon as my foot left. The other pinwheels around the surrounding graves weren't moving at all. It wasn't windy. I thought that it was weird that it stopped. So I went back and forth five times, crouching down to look at it and then stepping off of it. And every single time it would start and then stop whenever I crouched down to look at it and stepped back. It was changing speeds too. It did a slow two loop spin and then started going super fast. It may just be a weird coincidence, but I think otherwise. As I said earlier, I had been to this cemetery before. Every time I go, I always catch weird orbs, and I've gotten multiple apparitions too. So, at the very least, this place is full of energy. I remember when I was a kid that every school was built over a cemetery. It was cliche. But my elementary school actually was built over one. Ever since I was a little girl, I was heavily interested in the paranormal, and I always thought my school had something weird going on. For some reason, I was invested in proving to myself that I was right. In the fourth grade, my experiments began. I purposefully stayed later in my classroom, hoping something would happen. I was always alone for like 10 minutes every day in the classroom, and I waited for like five minutes in silence to hear something. I was slowly getting frustrated and decided to drop my experiments. But one day, it happened. I was alone in my classroom, putting some things away in my locker space as quickly as possible so I could join my friends on the patio. My classroom was at the end of the hallway on the second floor, so I was rushing to catch up. I could hear the muffled voices of the other kids outside. In one instant, it was like a crowd of people talking out loud just hit me in the ears. I couldn't understand a bit of what they were saying, but it was loud, louder than a bunch of kids playing outside. I grabbed my backpack and ran outside. When I was just by the stairs, I closed my backpack and walked to meet my friends. I was freaked out, but I didn't say anything to anybody. I didn't want a bunch of other kids to stay late in the classroom with me, and if someone told a teacher, they would think I was doing it for attention. Some weeks passed and I wasn't staying late anymore, because I didn't want to hear those voices again. One day, I thought it would be interesting to leave a piece of paper with a message for the ghosts hidden behind my books. I made sure nobody was there and that nobody could see it in plain sight. Sure enough, I received answers written on the paper. They were simple sentences, yes or no answers. Since my mom was a teacher at my school, I was the first kid to arrive at the classroom before anybody else would come in. I would open my message and I would see the answer. Eventually I stopped doing that because something about it just felt wrong 
and I could tell that the ghosts, or whatever they were, were getting a bit annoyed. It wasn't much, but it was enough that it made me believe in ghosts, and made me think that I was as awesome as the ghost hunters on TV. My wife and I were camping in a campground near Acadia National Forest. We realized the last night at the campground that there was an old family cemetery on the property near the tent sites. Later that night, after walking the dogs, we walked in that direction, listening to necrophonic on earbuds. As we got closer to the cemetery, the app became more active, with fewer pauses between words. It wasn't like the other times that we've had the app running. My wife walked over toward the gravestones to read some dates. While reading the dates, she said, if we're disturbing you, tell us and we'll leave. Then, very clearly, a deeper voice on Necrophonic said, leave. We apologized and we left the area. The only other experiences that have seemed like there was communication through that app were when we were introduced to the app in Gettysburg by a ghost hunting group. But those experiences were not as clear or direct as that night in Maine. I'm a strong believer in listening to my gut. I always have been, and always will be, since it's gotten me out of a few situations. One was my freshman year of high school. School had ended for the day, and since I was staying at my dad's house that week, I decided I would walk home. His house wasn't that far from school. Everything was fine, until I turned down the street, where there's a shortcut. It led straight into my neighborhood. As I was walking to the shortcut, a man drove by, staring at me. My stomach dropped and turned. I took this as a note to walk a bit faster. By the time I got into my neighborhood, the man was circling around the cul-de-sac, waiting for me. He had a smirk slowly creeping onto his face as I walked by his car. I tried to ignore him the best I could and just kept walking. He would drive past me and yell vulgar things at me. He kept turning around and driving past me again and again. As I turned down my street, he followed closely behind. I saw him drive down my street and turn into someone's driveway to turn back around. I quickly got into my house and locked the door behind me. I then turned around to look through the peephole so I could see if he left. He didn't. The man pulled up into my driveway and got out of the car. Luckily, my neighbor, who's a family friend, was out in his garage. He came over yelling at the man and then stayed with me until my dad got home. A week later, my dad told me he saw the man parked at the end of the street, waiting for me. He went and threatened the man and we haven't seen him since, but I'm still freaked out every time I go and visit my dad. It's safe to say I won't be walking home alone ever again. Last night, I was really bored again and decided that I wanted to see if I would have an experience at the cemetery at night. I waited until midnight and then went and nothing happened at first. I was just walking, and then my flashlight started to flicker. I went to go hit it to see if it would start working again, and I thought I heard a whisper. I turned around and shined my light on some stone, seeing something go behind it. I started walking to it, and then behind me, I heard a stick being stepped on. I immediately opened my phone and opened an app for a spirit box. 
I looked at the reviews and people said that it actually worked, so I figured, okay. Anyway, I was using the app and nothing was coming through when I previously tested it when I was hearing the voices. Nothing but static. So I decided to go to a really dark area where you can't even see the road. I asked if anybody was there and I thought I heard my name. I got a little bit scared, but I asked again. I said, I need to talk to you. And then I heard laughing like a madman and footsteps running around me. I ran into the light and then nothing but static again. I didn't experience anything after that until I walked to the exit and said, I'm leaving now, goodbye. And I heard a whisper right in my ear say my name. I ran all the way home and I didn't look back. And I don't think I'll go back again. So the other night, my boyfriend, daughter, who's three and a half, and I were walking in the cemetery a few blocks from our house. We drove because we wanted maximum walking time with the toddler. We planned to play Pokemon Go. We entered through the main entrance, and after a few steps, I started feeling nauseous and worried. Anxious. I didn't know why, so I just ignored it. We wanted to check out the huge headstones toward the middle, so we headed that way. We noticed a car parked with its lights off, no front license plate, passenger and back doors wide open, and the man is halfway in the back seat. He's parked on one side of the big headstones, which ended up being priests. We walked through and the guy noticed us. He closed the doors that were open, then went around to the driver's side and got in the car. He sat there and just watched us. So we veered away from him and went down a different path. My daughter all of a sudden says, they're so loud. I said, who? My daughter goes, the rocks, they're talking to me. My mouth drops open. We didn't tell her anything about the cemetery or headstones or what the place even is. She has no idea what they are other than big rocks. We ended up leaving, and as soon as we drove away, my nausea eased up. I told my boyfriend about feeling sick, and he freaked out and explained EMF to me. Creepy. We went to the store and passed the cemetery on the way home again. The man's car was still there. He left after we pulled down the street that we lived on. We've had one other paranormal experience with her before. This was the second time that the afterlife, ghosts, spirits, something, showed up to say that it exists, and it's confirmed for me. Later that night, she started talking about the rocks again and said that they were watching us. I asked her what they looked like, and she said, shadows. She said they looked like this, and then proceeded to make a worried expression. She told me that they couldn't walk with us and that they had to stay by the rocks. I don't know if the spirits were warning us about that man, or maybe there's just something not so good at that cemetery. But either way, it was a really interesting experience. I just got back from a visit to Gettysburg in Pennsylvania. I stayed at the Best Western next to Cemetery Ridge. My room actually looked out onto the ridge. On the first night, I woke up at about five in the morning and I looked out the window at the hill. It was a clear night without a moon, so the hill was completely dark. All I could see was the outline of the ridge. I stared at the ridge and tree line for about two minutes not really knowing what I was looking for. 
and just thinking about the battle there. For some reason, I started thinking about what if I saw a ghost or an orb? And at that very moment, a bright round white ball of light came in the tree line at the ridge of the hill. It didn't look like a flashlight since it didn't have a beam or variate in any way as it moved. It was about the size of a softball, I imagine, since it was about 150 yards away. It started moving right to left along the tree line and then sped off across the hill toward the angle. If you know that location on Cemetery Ridge, then you'll know what I mean. The whole thing lasted about 30 to 45 seconds. And as it was happening, I wanted to run over and grab my phone to take a picture or a video, but I didn't want to miss anything. I was also trying to figure out what it was. Once it was gone, there was nothing and nobody on the ridge from what I could see. So I got my phone and recorded for about 10 minutes while watching to see if it came back. Unfortunately, nothing appeared and daylight was starting to break. So I could actually start making out the trees and a few statues and monuments on the ridge. Needless to say, I couldn't get back to sleep. I feel like I should also add that the movement of light from right to left was erratic and when it sped off, it was extremely fast, leaving a trace of light behind it. In my opinion, nobody could have run that fast, and there was no indication of a motorcycle or a bike or a car anywhere nearby. So, I don't know, but it was cool nonetheless. My name is Josh and I am 26 years old. I was an only child and I didn't have very many friends, so I spent a lot of time alone. When I was about 11, I moved in with my grandparents. They lived in a small town, pretty rural, and I spent most of my days, especially on the weekends, outside walking around. There was an old cemetery within walking distance of my grandparents' house that had graves dating back all the way to the late 1600s in the oldest section. The newest graves were no younger than the late 90s and early 2000s. It was pretty run down since the newest graves, like I said, were in the 90s and 2000s. The oldest section was even more run down. I felt bad that these people were seemingly just forgotten and nobody ever visited them. My grandma owned a flower shop and she had a bunch of excess flowers, so I asked her if I could take some to put on some of the graves in the cemetery. She agreed and I took about four bags full and walked to the cemetery. I got there and started walking around, putting flowers on all the graves. I went through the newest section, putting flowers on the graves without incident. I had gotten through about four graves in the oldest section when something just told me to look up. I looked up and saw a woman just standing there, directly behind the grave that I had just put flowers on. She was smiling at me and she seemed to be so happy. I stood face to face with her for about a minute and then she disappeared. Then I went on putting flowers on the rest of the graves and I left. I think maybe she was just happy that somebody was coming to visit. I don't know, but it was really special. I'm really just telling this story as a way to vent because I'm in a situation where I really just feel stuck. I've tried just about everything so I guess I'm just going to start from the beginning. This story is two years in the making, so I'll try to be as thorough as possible. In 2019, I graduated with my master's degree and moved to a relatively rural area for my PhD. Thinking we'd make an investment, my dad and I purchased a house. The intent was to rent it out once I completed my PhD. 
This house was only a block away from a dive bar where my dad was able to make some pretty good friends. He introduced me to everyone and everyone let me know that I would be so happy in my new house because my next door neighbor was the absolute nicest guy you could ever meet. So we met the neighbor and he did seem nice enough. He suggested that we exchange numbers just in case I ever needed anything and I thought that was a good idea. What's the worst that could happen? A few days later, my dad left to go back to his home in another state and I was left to my own devices. Literally the day after he left, it started. My neighbor texted me while I was away and let me know that he left a gift for me on my front porch. In this text exchange, he started using pet names like Sweetie and Cutie. I went home and he had left a hand-painted feeding dish for my cats in my mailbox. At this point, I wasn't that alarmed. He was just being nice, I thought. The next day, he sent me more texts with pet names and I took the opportunity to make sure he knew that I was not interested in anything romantic. He replied back with a rambling text about how all a person ever needs is friends and he would just like to be friends with me. After that, he would send me texts frequently. Everything from inviting me fishing to telling me that he left more gifts on my porch. I would often not reply or I would tell him that I was busy. I didn't want to be rude, but I also had no interest in any sort of relationship with him other than being neighborly. One night, I got a text from the manager of the bar down the street, letting me know that if my neighbor knocked on my door, I shouldn't answer. She then told me that my neighbor had walked down to the bar with a hatchet and told the bartender he was hearing voices that got louder as he got closer to the bar. He threatened to kill someone with the hatchet if the voices didn't stop. They called the police and the police took the hatchet from him but made no arrest. The manager of the bar picked me up and I spent the night at her house. She told me that the police said my neighbor was heavy into meth. After that, I tried to keep my distance even more, but things got weirder. One day I went out to my car and I found a dead squirrel in my driveway. The squirrel had very clearly been run over and moved to right in front of my driver's side door. I just stepped over it, got in my car and left. When I returned home, the squirrel was gone. Shortly after, I received a text from my neighbor that said, someone or something put a dead squirrel in your driveway. Don't worry, I moved it for you. I felt like this was a weird way to word this and I suspect he's the one who put the squirrel in the driveway. Another time, I walked out of my house to see that he had placed an unspent shotgun shell on the bricks in front of his yard. He came out and told me that it was to serve as a warning for anyone walking between our houses. For the next couple of months, I did my best to avoid him. He would text me, inviting me over, and I would come up with an excuse or just ignore him completely. I wanted to remain cordial since he was my neighbor, but it was getting very annoying and I was uncomfortable. He would text me as soon as I got home, telling me that he was watching me come and go from my house. On Halloween, he handcrafted a large casket and wrote, here lies the last son of a bitch who played mind games, November, 2012. I mean, what the hell, right? All this time, he's still sending me texts. Eventually, I got really fed up and I just stopped responding completely. Less than two weeks after I stopped responding, he threw a 50 pound flower pot at my front door. You know, those big concrete planters? Yeah, one of those. I called the police who advised me to get a stalking no contact order. A few days later, I was watching TV when a notification popped up that my neighbor was trying to cast a video to my screen. I declined it, twice. I filed another report with the police. During this time, I started the process of getting a stalking no contact order. I saw three different victim advocates who all told me different things. I went out of town for a conference and during that time, someone had attempted to break into my home. I had an ADT security system, so while they didn't succeed, I was aware of the attempt. After the conference, I came home to the entire world shutting down because of the pandemic. 
I was trapped in my home 24 seven with my stalker neighbor next door. Luckily, court proceedings for protection orders didn't stop. Right before court, he sent me a text telling me that he was sorry for what he'd done, that he could tell when he saw me outside that he made me uncomfortable. Then he went on to tell me that he could tell my hair had gotten longer and I looked beautiful. I went to court and provided all of the evidence I had, the timeline of everything that had ever happened, the texts he'd sent me asking if I wanted a massage, the texts I sent him telling him that the way he was speaking to me was inappropriate, the text saying he knew he made me uncomfortable. I told the judge that I suspected he had attempted to break into my house while I was out of town. The kicker is he didn't deny any of it. Actually, he told the judge that he took full accountability for everything. He said he was in recovery and was trying to turn over a new leaf. He didn't oppose to the protection order at all. So in March of 2020, I actually received the stalking no contact order. Everything was pretty quiet for a while. I mean, he did some weird things, but that's because he's a weird guy. It wasn't anything that made me fear for my safety. That is until he started using again. At this time, we found an unspent shotgun casing in my flower bed. It was consistent with the one he had previously used to send a warning. This occurred a couple of months after I started dating my boyfriend, and I suspect it was a warning to him. After this, and for a variety of reasons, my boyfriend moved in with me. He moved in pretty quickly, but everything turned out fine. We're still together and happy as can be in our relationship. New Year's 2021, I was awoken to yelling. I turned on my security cameras and I got footage of him sticking his head out his window, screaming obscenities at my bedroom window for seven full minutes. It doesn't sound like a long time, but when your stalker is screaming threats and obscenities, seven minutes is a lifetime. He called me a harlot. He said, happy effing new year. He said he was going to blow up his house with his gas line. I called the police who responded. They told me that because he never said my name, they can't prove it was a violation of the protection order. The officer said, and I quote, there's nothing illegal about yelling in your own house. They left without even speaking to him. All I could do at this point was do my best to avoid him. I parked on the street because my driveway is pretty close to his front porch. I got used to living with my curtains drawn. I always made sure my cameras were charged, all five of them. Yes, because of him, I spent over a thousand dollars on cameras. Every inch of my yard is covered. Since then, he's been seen by me and by other neighbors talking to people who aren't even there, going outside and screaming nonsense. Things like, I have Cheerios on my necklace and other things. I'm not even joking. This basically brings me to last week. In the morning, I was getting ready for the day when I heard screaming. Someone is gonna die over this sweatshirt. I turned on the cameras. I got footage of him walking around the alley behind my house, screaming. Are you effing proud? How about I get my shotgun? I'll get everyone all fired up. I call the police. Once again, they didn't charge him with a violation of the protection order. Instead, they gave him an ordinance violation for disturbing the peace. The police told me that it seemed like he's off his meds again, and that was that. They left. Last night, I was awoken to hammering outside my window at 1 a.m. He was cutting down his privacy fence, horizontally. I called the police for a noise complaint and they just told him to stop. As I write this, he is outside, continuing to horizontally cut down his privacy fence. That means the privacy fence only stands about three feet tall now. This was the one thing that made me feel relatively safe about hanging out in my own backyard, and now that's gone. All of this to say, I'm freaking tired. I just want to live in a house where I can be sure that my neighbor won't try to kill me, where I can feel confident that he's not going to try to break in. My boyfriend and I are trying to buy a house and to move, but it's difficult. I'm a PhD student, so I don't make very much money. Renting won't work because I have four cats. Plus my partner's cat and dog, although we have a place secured for them if necessary. 
and finding a place to rent with so many animals is difficult, if not impossible. I refuse to rehome them, so maybe it's partially my fault that I'm stuck in this situation. My dad has agreed to co-sign on another mortgage and I've gotten a second job. We should be able to save up enough money within a few months, but until then, I'm stuck. I just don't know what else to do. I'm tired, I'm angry, so I figured I would tell this story to vent. This isn't even everything that happened. It's just something to give you an idea of what's been going on. I'm just so exhausted. I had an event transpire last night that is a small paragraph in the story of my haunted house. To understand the story, it helps to understand the history of the property. Before my house was a house, it was a Veterans of Foreign Wars club. To those that are unaware, it was a bar clubhouse for Veterans of Foreign Wars. The house is over 120 years old, and many people have passed through the doors over the decades. It seems likely that many tortured souls spent time there. There were probably soldiers, people that have done horrible things while fighting in our wars. I live in the USA, by the way. Some of my elderly neighbors talk to me about my house and its history when I'm out walking my dog. Some of them have even drank there, the real old neighbors. Paranormal experiences are pretty common things in this place, but this one was the most recent and it happened last night at around 11.30. I was laying in bed with my two cats. They were sleeping together at the end of the bed, and I was watching a movie on my tablet. The lights were on, so darkness did not obscure my vision. Here's where things get interesting. In a split second, both cats jolted themselves awake and began to fix their eyes on the doorway to the bathroom. I stopped my movie and tried to listen and observe. Keep in mind, both cats' eyes are perfectly fixed on the doorway, with gaze fixed on a central point in the middle upper height of the doorway. I found this strange, as there wasn't a sound to be heard. My first thought is that they were tracking a fly or a bug. It's winter and cold right now, and I don't think I've seen a bug in months. That's because no bug was there. My vision is unusually good and the lights were on and nothing was there. At least nothing I could see. At this point, I'm really trying to figure out what these two cats are looking at. They began to turn their heads horizontally as if someone was walking out of the bathroom toward the foot of my bed. While this was happening, their heads and eyes moved in sync with each other as if the two cats' bodies were attached by gears. I knew it wasn't a fly at this point for certain. Anyone with a cat knows how a cat will move when trying to hunt a fly. They'll look up, down, and in circles as the fly buzzes across the room. With their vision at the foot of the bed, they started to look up to me, as if someone was walking up toward me. My hair began to rise on the back of my neck. The pins and needles radiated down my spine and into my arms. All of my senses began to hyperfocus. No bug, no buzzing, but something is clearly there. I can sense the presence of someone there, breathing. The air is cold and feels heavy. At or around this time, I realize I'm having a visit from one of the house's many ghosts. I used to be much more afraid of these kinds of occurrences, but now I just kind of accept it. Anyway, wide-eyed, the cats are staring at something right next to me. In perfect synchronization, their eyes slowly moved up, staring directly over my chest where I was laying. I can sense someone standing over me, looking down on me. This freaked me out. Loudly and out of reflex, I yelled, what the F? For no reason and without any input, the Alexa on my table said, do you want to see something paranormal? Please remember, this is still real life. There's no embellishment. 
There was no reason for my tablet to do this, and also it was really loud. Now I'm very spooked. However, I realize that this thing, or spirit, or whatever, is trying to communicate with me. I did not ask for Alexa, nor did I mention any keywords like ghost, or haunted, or whatever. Also, as an aside, later I tried to see what settings Alexa was on, and I couldn't find that info because Alexa wasn't even on. I always shut off Alexa because she's kind of annoying. I only turn her on whenever I need something. So there's really no reason for Alexa to have been working. In any event, I decided to reply to Alexa, and I said, no thanks. The air in the room lifted, the cat settled back down, and I tried to sleep and got little. Those two cats saw something that I could not. Whatever it was, it walked out of the bathroom, past the foot of my bed, made a 90 degree turn and stood over me, and tried talking to me through my tablet on an Alexa that wasn't even active. My grandparents moved from Ohio in the late 70s to start a life in Florida. An opportunity to manage a ranch was a dream come true for them. When I was about eight years old, I used to visit them once a month for around two weeks each to stay. I loved it. The smell of cow manure brings me to a special time in my life, but it also brings back horrifying memories. The ranch is located in Florida. Not much history was given to my grandparents before arriving. Shortly after, the owners started to spill the beans. Bound by contract, my grandparents had an obligation to stay for the span of 10 years. The land had some native history as well as an unfortunate side in the front of the house of the property. An old Navy sailor hung himself several years before. The land has several different ponds and trails, which made for awesome adventures. I had a lot of fun, until my strange experience. My father and I decided to go fishing at one of the more interesting ponds. At the time, I had no idea what made this pond so interesting. But later, when I was an adult, I was told why. The pond was shaped like a donut and had a small mound at the center of the pond, around 45 feet from the shore. It was perfectly centered. From my understanding, somebody was buried at the center of this pond. Not sure if this is true, mostly stories and no real evidence. But anyhow, my father and I began fishing. I grabbed my small bait caster sized rod and began to hook a worm by the hook. I used a little red and white bobber. I was the type that wanted to fish away from anyone as I thought it would raise my chance of catching something. But that day, something caught me. I cast my line in the water and sat down right at the edge of the water with my feet slightly in it. I felt like a man with my rubber boots like my old man. About 20 minutes or so later, I noticed my bobber was going under and back up, so I decided to set my hook. As I tugged back, it felt like something big was on the line. I tugged and reeled, tugged harder and reeled, and my line wouldn't let go. It was stuck on something. At this point, my father was on the other side of the mound and out of my sight. So, in big boy fashion, I decided to walk into the water to see if I could tug it in a different direction, possibly freeing my line. I'm about four feet in, and the water was just at the edge of my knee-high boots. I'm not sure if this made sense, but it felt like it was what I was supposed to do. Finally, after tugging my line even harder, it was freed, as though nothing had ever been on it in the first place. Even the worm was still hanging off the hook. Feeling proud, I decided to walk out of the water and recast my line. This is where things got crazy. About a foot away from being completely out of the water, my left foot slipped on a rock. 
I brought my right foot forward to catch my balance, and a smaller stone dug itself into the shin of my left leg. It hurt like hell. As I realized what had just happened, I went to pull my left leg forward, but I couldn't. I felt my foot pulling back. I struggled trying to pull my leg forward, even spinning around, with my butt now in the water. I started to scream, yelling for my father. It was as if my scream fell on deaf ears. I was being pulled into the water by something. I didn't feel hands or anything actually on my foot. It's just that my leg was not free, and I was gradually going farther and farther into the water. I was screaming bloody murder at this point, and after about 20 seconds of fighting and yelling, whatever had my foot let go. I was soaked and horrified. I ran to my father, screaming, bleeding from my left leg and in somewhat of a shock. While yelling, I asked my father, why didn't you come to me when I was screaming? My father, now shaking because of what I looked like, said, Son, I didn't hear any screaming. I couldn't see you from the other side. I'm calming down a little bit at this point, and I ask him again. His reply was the same. I didn't hear you, son. Needless to say, after showing my father and explaining what happened to me, like most parents would, he just shrugged it off and said that my imagination had gotten the best of me. I never fished on that property again. Nobody actually believes it happened. They all tell me that I was caught on something or I made it up or it was all in my head. And I know that this is something that sounds outlandish, but something that I couldn't see had me that day and it wanted me. I'm not here to convince anybody, just to share. This may be a ramble of thoughts, but after recently hearing about missing 411 and the like, I finally felt like I could offer something that my family and I experienced a few years ago that to this day gives me a shiver. Hopefully you enjoy this story. I've been camping, solo backpacking, and hunting my whole life in Oregon and felt comfortable in the woods, and I have a deep respect for nature. A few years ago, my wife, daughter, and two German shepherds went camping north of Mount Jefferson, Oregon. We found our campsite to be the perfect setup for us and our two dogs, who need the privacy, since they're intimidating to other dog owners and can be loud when spooked. It wasn't an established campsite, just a nice horseshoe off of a U.S. Forest Service road that had flat ground, full trees, and a fire pit. The first night, my daughter wanted to sleep by herself in a two-man tent right next to ours. It was maybe two feet away from my wife and I's tent. We made the male German Shepherd sleep with her in her tent. His name is Guts. That whole first night, neither my wife or I could sleep. We both heard footsteps, and they were heavy. Not like typical forest critters scampering around in the night. I was well armed because I was paranoid from having read recently before departing about a dad in California who was shot and killed in a tent next to his two infant daughters. Needless to say, both my wife and I had two pistols and I had my rifle with me. The dogs are great at detection and that's why I felt my daughter could sleep alone because Guts is completely fearless and nothing would lay a hand on her without a battle to the death. All in all, nothing but bad vibes and loud footsteps occurred that night, which I ultimately decided had to be a deer or maybe some elk. Day two, morning. We go for a walk down the road and maybe 300 feet away, we see this circle area. I see this abandoned road where a rusted gate post was covered in vegetation. The gate was missing. Something of a blue color caught my eye, and Guts immediately takes off running down this abandoned road. My heart begins to race, because I think if it's another family camping like us, he's going to get himself shot or scare some innocent people to death. 
So I chase after him as fast as I can, and the rest of the family follow. He stops after 20 feet into the road, and me yelling his name. But I've covered just enough distance to see that there's nobody there. But there's something really off about the sight. I yell, Hello, is anyone there? Sorry about the dog. I got no response. My curiosity gets the best of me, and I have to see what the sight conditions are. As I get closer, I just know something is wrong. It had all the necessities for a campsite, including a cooler, propane burner, tent, blankets, folding table, everything. But every single item had been completely destroyed, smashed, and torn apart from what appeared to be claw marks. We all walked around in circles, puzzled why anybody would leave all of their camping gear behind, including a fairly expensive REI tent. I figured, well, someone left in a hurry and the animals got to the rest. It had to be the only logical explanation, right? Still, a propane tank and a cooler were flattened by something, and it certainly wasn't snowpack with tree coverage in that spot. As the afternoon rolls in, my daughter and I are playing ball at the campsite, and my wife goes walking maybe 70 feet north to do her business. I don't have a direct line of sight on her, but all of a sudden I see Guts make a mad dash straight toward her. Normally he would always be with me unless he's called over and she didn't call for him. His speed and focus caught my attention and I knew something weird was happening. So I ran over there and my wife starts jogging at me and I immediately draw my pistol. Guts has completely continued running into the forest another hundred feet before I call him, and he stops. My other dog, Leia, who never misses the opportunity to be the pack leader, is not taking point. I've had her for now seven years, and this was the first time in her life that she refused to leave my daughter's side. She was full hair raised and attached to us at the hip. Again, anytime we hike or play, Leah is up front, bossing everything in her path, pausing to see where we all are and then continuing on. I asked my wife what had happened, and she said, I was trying to pee and all of a sudden I felt all my hair raise. I knew someone was watching me. Then I saw Guts running toward me and I just got up to move toward you. We spent 10 minutes looking for signs of anything and saw no trails, no broken branches, Nothing to point to what and where something might have gone. We decide that we're spending one more night since it's too late to pack up and drive, but we'll all be in the big tent together. Before we go to bed, I put a rope with a makeshift coin alarm around the perimeter of our campsite. I used a mint can and some coins and keys from our truck and zip tied it so that anything hitting the rope gave a little jingle. Very unsophisticated, but it put my wife at ease. As I go to tie my last corner off at a tree near our tent, our third mystery item unveils itself. It looks like someone has done the exact same thing that I have done with a rope that was so old and brown I didn't see it at first. It was broken, and only a few pieces remained. But sure enough, it was tied at roughly the same height, about 8 to 10 inches off the ground, and even had a few rusted washers on it. I immediately felt that someone had stayed here before and had put the same makeshift warning system on the same tree that I am, maybe 10 or 15 years ago based on the condition of the rope. Perhaps my paranoia has now reached a new height, but I had to make sure that the girls felt we were safe. And at the time, the only thing I could think of was when the evening came I made them sit in the truck and I fired a clip of my 45 into the dirt as a signal to whatever was out there that we were armed. I reassured the girls that anybody listening to that knows that we have two wolves and are armed and are too risky of a target so we can sleep safely. That night we heard no footsteps and the dogs never perked up and barked. We left early the next morning Fast forward to today and I watched the Amazon Missing 411 Hunted documentary. 
and I noticed the cluster smack dab close to where we camped that weekend, and a flood of dread rushes at me as I think of that mysterious abandoned campsite with the ripped tent and the smashed cooler and cooktop. We've been camping since and have enjoyed the beauty of the Pacific Northwest, but there was something there at that place that possibly took or harmed someone else less than 300 feet away from where we camped. We all thank our lucky stars that Guts was doing his thing so well that afternoon. As an update, Guts is no longer with us. He has journeyed into the next phase, and there isn't a day that goes by that I don't think about him and how he likely saved us that night. He was a warrior, and his new brother, Geronimo, has his spirit. While kayaking on Green River, traveling above Mammoth Cave in Kentucky, these friends would encounter a sound they had never heard before, and one they hoped to never hear again. Here's their story. A few years ago, my friends and I went on a 45-mile, three-night kayaking trip down the Green River in Kentucky, which runs above the Mammoth Cave System, the world's longest known cave system, with more than 400 miles of surveyed passageways. We brought everything we needed in our kayaks and one canoe, food, tents, water filtration, etc., and camped each night on the riverbank when it started getting dark, and we found level enough ground most of the time. The first night was uneventful, except to say that there is nothing like a wall of fireflies against a mountainous black tree line at night in the middle of nowhere beautiful. The second day around sunset, after a long day of kayaking and baking in the July heat, we came upon a stream on the bank that opened up into a large ravine. The stream, as we found out, was a cave spring, pouring out blue, freezing cold cave water into a lagoon about 30 feet wide and so deep that the blue water turned black after a few feet. The lagoon had a long, sandy beach, secluded by hills on either side, and a tall, overhanging cliff behind and above us. It was a beautiful, otherworldly place. Time moved very slowly there. We decided to camp there for the night. The sand was soft, white, and very fine, ideal for ground sleeping. For some reason, the place deeply frightened me, but I didn't speak up. We were all tired and everyone was having fun. We built a small fire and enjoyed the stars through the leaf canopy for a while before everybody went to bed. I slept hard that night. At around 5 a.m., I woke up with an urge to relieve myself. It was still dark. I had the tent door zipper about halfway opened and had just popped my head out when I heard a loud and terrible roar or scream. I immediately cowered back into the tent and zipped it closed, and I waited. The scream came from about 10 feet to my left, near the dwindling fire. It was high-pitched, not like an owl's screech, although I'm not ruling that out. It was a wretched, pained scream that got lower pitched toward the end. Being that we were in the middle of nowhere, Kentucky, most likely it was a fox or a boar or some kind of bird. Whatever it was, I lay awake for an hour, listening. I heard absolutely nothing. Granted, we were on a soft beach, but I didn't hear a single twig snap or leaf crinkle when whatever it was finally shuffled away. It was bizarre. I should mention at this time that up the beach and off to the side of the lagoon was a small, dry cave opening, maybe three feet wide. I cannot say with any certainty that it was not some ancient, cave-dwelling creature that surfaced to investigate our camp. I somehow fell back asleep and awoke the next morning shaken. 
I asked if any of my friends had heard the terrible scream, but remarkably, nobody had. We pressed on down the Green River. The third night, at dusk, we came upon a large rocky beach. We pulled our boats ashore and decided that this would have to do, as we didn't want to go any farther down river and risk being stuck on the water at dark. This rocky beach was where the river split in two, and, in the middle, formed a collection of pale rocks, tall grass and dried out wood, a desolate pile of muck the size of a football field. The landmass was covered in jumping sand spiders and tiny frogs. Again, otherworldly. We set up camp, ate, and all went to bed around the same time. It was silent for probably 20 or 30 minutes, I'm not sure. I was asleep, as the others most likely were as well. Suddenly, my dream was interrupted by what sounded like a booming, loud, mechanical, wooden beast. I awoke and shot straight up. It was truly the loudest thing I have ever heard. It sounded like a massive bulldozer tearing down a huge steel and wood building. Then came a boom, followed by its echo throughout the river valley. The animals shifted and the birds flew away. We were all awoken by the crash and yelling in confusion to each other in our tents. Nothing but silence followed outside our tents and nobody was particularly willing to shine a flashlight toward the woods. Eventually, we all decided it had to have been a falling tree and we went back to sleep. The next morning, I thought about it some more it didn't sound like just a falling tree. I must stress that it had a metallic quality and it was projected purposefully. It almost sounded like a roar. In the morning light, we found no evidence of anything out of the ordinary, nor any obvious fallen trees that could have made such a loud sound. So we packed up and headed out onto the river one last time to go home. My friends and I still talk about that trip and all the strange things that happened. We did the same kayak trip a couple of years later, and nothing out of the ordinary happened at all. No mysterious forest noises, to both my disappointment and relief. In this story, Reddit user Pineapple Juice tells us some strange tales about the house she grew up in. Here's the story. So back when I was about to start second grade, me, my mom, and my sister had to move to the next town over because my sister had gotten into a fight. This was the town my mom grew up in and where my grandparents lived. I don't know why, but my mom kept on choosing the much older houses in the town, like before 1900s old. I personally didn't care, until we got to the house. I remember the absolute nervousness I felt when I walked into the house. I felt like I was being watched, and I absolutely hated it. When we got to what was going to be my room, I felt decent, I guess. I stayed in there for most of the tour, I believe. Maybe I was taking in my surroundings, but I remember that I liked the walls, and before I left, I waved and said goodbye. I felt as though I had to say it. When we were leaving, we had to drive across the front, and in the second attic, there was a window on every side of the house. There was this girl who was translucent and very old-timey looking. She was gray, but where her eyes were supposed to be were a dark gray, and what I could only assume was blood dripping down her face. Well, once we moved in, I remember that this is where my talking habit I have yet to break comes in. I would just talk and talk for hours. I would explain what I was watching for absolutely no reason, even when nobody was there. 
Well, one night after we got completely moved in, I decided to knock on the floor. I got a knock back, and I remember that it made me feel not so lonely. This happened until I was a solid 10 years old, and I think that's where everything began to go downhill. That's where everything started. The feeling of being watched intensified. I never felt alone. When I was about nine and in the third grade, I went to sleep at a decent time. I never really had before. I woke up facing away from the door. It was odd, and I felt eyes practically burning into my back. I turned and guess who I saw? The little girl. She couldn't have been much older than me at the time. I remember my fear, how I felt, how her not eyes followed me. Eventually, I got the courage to walk past her and into my sister's room. She told me that I was dreaming and that I should go back to bed. And when I got back to my room, she was gone. But this is when the activity really began. I would see a female and a male shadow person. I brushed it off at first. I thought I was just crazy. So I would just move past it and stop worrying about it. I swear that little girl played with me. Dolls, superheroes, outside, all of it. No matter where I was, no matter how I was playing or what I was playing with, there she was, messing with things, playing alongside. I swear looking back that I could hear a woman's hum sometimes whenever I would try to sleep. We'll get this. My sister's now husband, at the time boyfriend, slept in my room while I was at my grandparents, and he supposedly saw the little girl. And once my sister heard the story, she was like, oh my gosh, my sister wasn't lying. And her boyfriend was like, that is weird. My sister always hated going past my room to the bathroom, but like everything else, we just moved past it. My godbrother, who's about two years older than me, saw a little boy with me that I couldn't see. Well, one time we were joking around with some fake Ouija board on my phone, and it led us to what we called the front room. I kid you not, there was a little boy who was exactly the same as the little girl in our window, who just smiled at us and waved. We got out of there. I remember that any time I felt sad, I knew I wasn't alone. Any time something was wrong, I always felt safe. I felt loved. But I know that right before I left the house, right up until I was gone at 11, maybe 12 years old, I would always stop if I saw a shadow or a figure. I'd go back to where they were and wave a hello before I continued. Before my mom and I moved out, because my sister's a grown woman now, I knocked on the floor one last time, and I got a slight tap. And just then, I said goodbye one last time before we moved out. That house had a lot more things happen to it as well. For instance, the old owner once came by to check it out and ask questions, but nobody remembers the guy before us coming to the house. I remember him vividly. All in all, the house I grew up in was very haunted. When Redditor Dr. Jim Danger and his friends went camping at 18 years old, they met and hung out with a strange old man. It wasn't until two months later that they realized the eccentric man in the woods was far more dangerous than they'd realized. This is their story. When I was about 18, some friends and I took a road trip about seven hours or so down to the Apalachicola National Forest near Tallahassee, Florida. We were going to do a little car camping drink a few ice-cold natty lights, you know, 18-year-old stuff. As such, though, we didn't want to be bothered by any park rangers, so we drove way into the woods. We got there, set up camp, had said natty lights, and one of the guys in our group and I decided to do a little exploring. 
We walked about a hundred yards from our site back to the main road and saw another path directly across from us. We started walking. Immediately, we started to see signs that somebody had lived there for a while. Big bags of trash, stuff like that. Should have been a huge red flag to turn around. But, you know, 18. Nothing could hurt us, right? So we get to this campsite of an older white guy living out of his van. Clothesline strung up, coolers placed around it, and a big gorgeous dog. I think maybe a golden retriever. We tried to back out, but he sees us and starts talking. He's friendly enough, asks us where we're from, tells us about some cool spots to check out in the park, and we ended up chatting for 10 minutes or so before going on our way. I kept thinking to myself how odd it was that he gave us directions in steps, not yards or miles. The guy always seemed to be off balance, too. Not stumbling drunk, but more like he was walking on a balance beam, swaying side to side. The other thing that seemed a little odd was how absolutely enthusiastic he was when talking about the national parks and forests where we were from. I mean, super excited. But whatever, right? We shook it off. The camping part was over, and we went back to our tents. The rest of the trip went well, and we didn't think about it again. Until two months later. The same buddy that I'd met that guy with calls me really late at night, wakes me up, tells me to turn on the TV to the news. I oblige. I see an old dude with a van. You see where this is headed, but I didn't. So I got pretty pissed at my friend for waking me up. I was about to hang up when he said, No, watch! And then... I see the golden retriever, and it all clicks. What the heck? The news report was about a murder. A few, actually. That man's name was Gary Michael Hilton, convicted of at least four murders. He kidnapped and murdered a girl on Blood Mountain, Georgia, an older couple in North Carolina, and a girl in the Apalachicola literally at the campsite that we had spoken to him on, not that long after we left. And yes, all of the places where he had victims were the very same places he had been so enthusiastically talking to us about. Obviously, we call the cops. They put us in touch with the Florida Bureau of Investigation, and we get flown down to take investigators to the campsite. We pointed out every spot where we'd seen anything, told them exactly what he told us, and showed them the places he described to us. I didn't find out until after the trial, but apparently they found what appeared to be partially destroyed human finger bones in an area near the site. We even had to fly down to testify. To this day, it's the craziest thing I've ever experienced, and I'd be more than happy if it stayed that way. I was a kid. When I was a kid in the 90s, I would often sleep at my grandmother's house in the middle of a small village in the Jura region of France. The bedroom I would stay in was called the room in the back. As the name suggests, it was one of the last two rooms at the end of a main corridor shaped like an L. There wasn't anything special about that bedroom. It was pretty small and contained a bed, shelves with books, and some other very basic furniture. Yet, for some reason, that room creeped me out. I felt an unwelcoming presence, and I would always struggle to fall asleep, scared of whatever invisible forces seemed to be lurking in the dark. One night there, when I was around eight years old, I woke up scared and confused. I found myself lying down on the floor and in total darkness. I feel like I need to make two things clear here. This is the only time in my entire life that I have ever awakened outside of whatever bed or couch I'd been sleeping in. Second, 
Despite the fact that the house is located in a small village, it wasn't particularly isolated, and the street lights outside would always let a little bit of light filter through the closed blinds at night. So here I was, a child, surrounded by total obscurity, struggling to understand why I wasn't in my bed. I tried my best to stay calm and touched around me, hoping to find the side of the bed nearby so I could climb back into it, but I simply could not find it. I tried for several minutes, but it just didn't seem to be there, which was extremely strange considering that the bedroom wasn't that big in the first place. I therefore decided to move forward in a single direction to find a wall, and then I could follow that wall until I found the bed. But things got even stranger as I tried to find a wall. I would bump into furniture that I didn't recognize, and despite all of my efforts, I could not find a wall anywhere. Everything around me was completely and utterly unfamiliar. I thought about calling for help, my grandmother was sleeping in the bedroom on the other side of the corridor, and my parents in the living room. However, I imagined them finding me screaming on the floor and decided not to, not wanting to face that kind of embarrassment. Finally, I fell asleep on the floor, giving up on finding the bed. The next morning, I woke up in that bed under the blankets. It was like the entire event had been nothing more than a weird dream yet it absolutely did not feel like a dream. I am a natural lucid dreamer, and even back then I was already very familiar with how dreams feel, and this just wasn't one. A few years ago, a long time after this strange occurrence, I went to England to visit my aunt, who's from the other side of the family. She claims to be a witch and is into a lot of new age stuff. I've always been skeptical, but I have to admit that she's done and said a few strange things that got me to go from not believing her at all to being a little bit more neutral about it. We were talking about our respective families, and she went on about the only time when she had ever been to my grandma's house when I was a baby. I thought it was a good opportunity to see if she had sensed anything unusual there, and I asked her making sure to keep the question open so as not to influence her. The first thing she said was, Ah, yes, the room in the back. She said it in English and had no idea that we called it that way in French too. There is something wrong with that room, she said. I was spooked. Once I got back to France, I decided to confront my mother about it since she'd spent her childhood in that house. As soon as I asked her what was wrong with that room in the back, she froze, and her face became white. She explained to me that when she was little, she went into that bedroom with a few friends, and they tried to invoke spirits for fun. They sat down on the floor in a circle, holding hands, and said, Spirit, if you're here, knock three times. They immediately heard three very violent knocks and ran off screaming. She told me that ever since then, the room had felt weird. That's it. Nowadays, the room is pretty different, but still used as a guest bedroom. It still feels weird, but I'd say a lot less so than when I was a kid. I know my brothers, who are 10 years younger than I am, have also complained about feeling uncomfortable there for some reason, but they never had any unusual experience there. Just a feeling. This happened in Fresno County, November 2015, around 3 o'clock in the morning. I am a medic on an ALS unit, and I was working my normal 1900 shift. I was dispatched to a Code 3 cardiac arrest for a side hanging at around 3 o'clock. The call info only had that the patient was a 34-year-old male hanging and the sheriff and PD were on scene. The location was in the more desolate farm properties in the valley. No street lights, just dark, cold, and engulfed in dense fog during the winter. Rolling up, I see a man dressed head to toe in black. Black shoes, 
black pants, black long sleeve shirt, black beanie, I mean everything. He was in handcuffs, sitting on his hands, with two officers surrounding him, a female, and two very young kids by the house's front door. There was a broken rope noose on the ground underneath this oddly large, wicked-looking gray skeleton of a tree. The man had a small laceration and a rope burn on his neck, but he was very much alive. When looking at him, his eyes had little of the white and were black. He was quiet until I sat him on the ambulance gurney. The man was sobbing, trembling, and screaming that he can't take it anymore. As I was putting on our leather restraints on his wrists, I noticed that he had deep horizontal cutting scars along both of his wrists. He was only trembling now, as if he was scared. All I could feel was cold. This man was clearly struggling and decided that night he would give up and end it all, leaving his wife or girlfriend and two children behind. So far, just a sad story, right? Well, this is where it gets freaky. I have never seen anything like this or heard of an experience like this ever before. Three years later, it still gives me the chills every time I think about it. On the way to the hospital, a few good miles down the road, we made a wrong turn, got a little lost and took a back road. He was quiet and trembling. He wasn't fighting the restraints he almost seemed to feel safer in the back of the ambulance. While I concluded assessing, I got this bone-cold shiver down my spine. I looked out the window and saw this house. Mind you, there are acres between every single house out here. Well, this house was like the others. It looked normal, but next to it was this big tree or bush and in a separate tone and position was this old four-door sedan, parked. The car looked out of place and was clearly separated from the house and the tree and bush. It was like the car was its own place. It was really odd and creepy. I can normally see into the car's cab and see the headrest of the driver's seat from afar, but this car was pitch black on the inside almost as if the darkness was coming out of the windows, because it was the deepest and darkest black I've ever seen. All I saw inside was this deep black and two neon dark blue eyes staring back at me, a little above where a tall and very large man's eyes would be in a car. Immediately I felt the back of the ambulance get colder and there were goosebumps on my skin. At first, I thought it was a security light or a reflection in the car. But as we passed the house, the car turned on, pulled out, and started following us in the ambulance. The neon blue eyes were still there, and the cab was still as dark as ever. The car followed us miles to the highway, still with those eyes staring, and the deepest, darkest black in the cab. Even with all the street lights, I could not see into the car. I was almost mystified by this and nearly forgot about my patient. All I knew was that I did not feel welcomed by these dark blue neon eyes. It was almost threatening and felt as if it wanted my patient. We were on the highway and this car was still following us over 20 miles now. The neon dark eyes were still there, and I still couldn't see into the car. It got colder. I started to feel as if it noticed me watching, and was watching and focusing on me now instead of my patient. The car then sped up and pulled up next to the ambulance in the next lane while we were driving, and looked directly at me. I was very literally five feet from this car, and I could see nothing through the windows. All I could see were those eyes. But they weren't looking ahead. They were looking directly at me. In that moment, I said quietly but out loud, Go away. You are not touching this man. 
This man is my patient, and if you want him, you'll have to come through me. I'm stronger than you, and I will not let you have him. After I said that, not even a moment later, the car and my ambulance split off. As one went onto one off-ramp, and the other, I don't know where it went. It was no longer cold in the ambulance, and my patient was no longer gray in the cheeks, but now his cheeks were pink and normal. It wasn't until after the call and when we got the patient inside the hospital when I realized what had just happened. I truly feel that whatever those deep neon blue eyes belonged to was not human, and that it wanted that man. I've never believed in the paranormal or demons or spirits or anything that wasn't hardcore science until this. I haven't had an encounter like that again, and I hope I never do. I don't know if that man is still alive or what his outcome was, but all I know is what I experienced and saw that night. And it was horrifying. I was an EMT and then a paramedic for eight years before becoming a registered nurse. It was a decent sized city, 100,000 plus citizens, and loads of weird history. I had a lot of things happen, but this is the story that I will never forget. There was one house that we would go to pretty regularly that was beyond haunted. I don't know who or what lived and died in there before the then present patient. There were mannequins in the living room, several. I never asked because I didn't want to be in there any longer than necessary. The first time we were called there, I stood on the stoop trying to will my body to go in. The atmosphere in there was intimidating. It almost felt like the house was saying, come in if you dare. My partner was male, so I thought, meh, we'll be fine. I'm a five foot four female, and I can hold my own in a bar fight. Threatening presences I cannot see are another story. We get to our patient, and as I'm hooking up the EKG, someone backed into me, knocking me off the balls of my feet. I was squatting next to the couch. I tell my partner to back up, and he says, from what? I look up and he's on the other side of the room, nowhere near me or the couch. So I turn around. There's nothing there, but I'm eyeballing these mannequins up against the wall, a good 15 to 20 feet away. I shake it off and go back to what I'm doing, and again I'm knocked over. I tell my partner to knock it off, but now he isn't even in the room. He wandered to the kitchen to gather the patient's medications. Now I'm on my feet. There's no way that this happened twice from nothing. I turn back to these mannequins again. One has shifted slightly away from the wall, now standing with a shoulder to it, when before its back was against it. I asked the patient a bit too late if anyone else was in the home. Scene safety should have been first, but yeah, oops. She said no, it was just her and the cat. Thinking this cat must be a puma or something, I start to look for it. Unfortunately, Peanut was no bigger than my American size 7 foot. I had only ventured to the hallway, maybe 10 feet from the couch, but out of view of the mannequins. When I walked back into the living room, that mannequin was now facing me. Every hair on my body stood up. Not today, Satan. We packaged her up got her in the truck for transport, and got away from that tiny house. Lo and behold, dispatch sends a request to my tablet for an explanation of a long scene time. I had to put harassed by mannequins in a run ticket without looking like I needed to be on a 72-hour hold. We went back to that house three more times that month. I called from the door for her to come to me. I'm not that stupid. I will never go in there again unless I absolutely have to. Mm -hmm. 
So, I live in a small town in the southwest of Scotland. One of those towns where if you don't know someone, you will definitely know one of their friends. In 2015, I moved into a flat or apartment with my two children and my partner. The flat seemed nice and it was in a quiet part of town. Needless to say, we were all really happy with the move. At the time, my eldest son Bobby was four and my youngest Derek was three. Soon after moving in, I started noticing strange things happening. For example, the washing machine turned itself on and off at the wall. Doors opened on their own. But the strangest incidents were yet to come. One night, when the kids were in bed, about six months after moving in, Bobby came running to the living room and said, Daddy, please could you come and tell the hand in my room to stop trying to play with my teddy bears? So, naturally, I went into his room and told this, what I thought was imaginary, hand off. About two weeks later, my son Bobby came to me again. With the complete matter-of-fact innocence of a child, he goes, Daddy, did you know there's a ghost in your attic? I didn't think much of it. Kids will be kids. The next day, I was at work, talking to a colleague about where we'd moved to. Out of nowhere, he goes, Hey, did you know that back in April of 2014, some young guy hung himself in your flat? Suddenly, Bobby talking about a ghost in the attic started to feel a lot more concerning. What blows my mind is that Bobby had never talked about ghosts before moving here. At the time, he didn't even know what an attic or a loft was. I did some digging and even spoke to a friend who's a local police officer. I asked him about the whole incident with the young guy, and he goes, Oh yeah, that's true. He hung himself in the attic up there. We still live in that house, and to this day, strange things happen from time to time. Most recently, the TV turned itself on and turned the volume up to full blast, all on its own. I was the only one home at the time. What's really strange is that my youngest son Derek has never mentioned anything ghostly. It's all very strange, but very real. I worked as a paramedic on an ambulance during the night shift. One morning, we received a medical call for a patient who was having difficulty breathing. Upon arrival, we entered the patient's home, which was one of the smallest homes I have ever seen. It was about 400 square feet total. You walked into the living room, which connects to a kitchen and then connects to the only bedroom. When we walked in, we saw the patient in the back of the room. During our assessment of her, the cops that were with us kept asking if somebody else was in the house because they said they thought they heard something. With the patient's size and the condition of the front porch, we decided to go out of the sliding door inside the patient's room. After getting the patient into the ambulance, I went back inside the home while the police left for another call after helping lift the patient. I was going in the back room to get our bags and turn off the lights, but when I entered the home, the lights were off. They had all been on just moments before, and it's not like the snow was bad enough to take down power lines in that amount of time. We checked later and no power had gone out anywhere else. I tried the lights to no avail. I thought it was weird, but I didn't think much of it. Then I was walking in the kitchen. When I looked down to find our bags all piled up and zipped up, I then felt that there was something in the house. I grabbed the bags and ran out. I found out right after getting outside that my radio had died. It was fully charged when I walked in there. I had thought that the cops put the bags in the kitchen, but they were outside the home before us to help the patient. I was the last one out of that house and our bags were opened up all the way because we had to get the patient various items from each bag. I have no explanation for how our bags got packed up and zipped up, and to this day, nobody is taking credit.
I am a carer and I have been for about five or six years. I prefer to work nights as it's a calmer working experience. I've seen and heard many strange things, but two stick out and I thought I'd tell you about it. The first one. I was on shift one night and every hour we have to do checks on the residents to make sure that they're okay and still with us. So I'm doing my checks and everything is going okay until I get to the last room. This lady likes her door closed at night, so the light in the corridor doesn't wake her up. And I go to open her door, but I couldn't move it. It was as if someone was pushing it shut from the other side. I try two or three times to open it, and it just won't budge. Fearing that the lady has fallen behind it, I go to get the nurse on shift and my colleagues. Each of us try to open the door, but it won't move. After 20 minutes or so, the door opens easily, as it should do, and the lady was asleep in bed, snoring away, and there's nothing there to have kept the door closed. I should mention that this was in a part of the building that no one likes to be alone in, as it always feels like you're being watched. On a couple of occasions, a shadow has been seen in some of the rooms. The second. I came in on shift and found out that one of the residents had passed away just 30 minutes before the night staff got there. We were waiting for the undertakers to come and collect the body. It could be up to two hours before they got there. As we were going about our job, the buzzer went off in that room. I went and switched it off and left the room. His buzzer went off every 10 minutes until the undertakers arrived, and none of us could ever explain why or how it was doing that. This happened a couple of years ago when I was around 13 to 14 years old. I would go to Nerf Wars with my friends during the weekends with a semi-auto rifle and one of those revolver-looking pistols as a sidearm. On one of those occasions, I brought my girlfriend to the Nerf War with me. For some context, my girlfriend's my neighbor, she lives in the same area I do, and we've known each other for some time, since around preschool I think. As you do for a Nerf War, you pack up spare darts, spare mags, etc. So the Nerf war ended and we had a great time as usual, and we went our separate ways. As my girlfriend and I start walking back home, my paranoia kind of kicks in, and I have a feeling that someone is following us. I glanced back slightly, and there was a guy in full black. At first I thought it was just one of my friends awkwardly following us, but then I remembered that none of them were wearing full plain black that day. So I turn back to my girlfriend and tell her that I think we're being followed. She glances back slightly and sees the same guy. She starts panicking, so I tell her to calm down. It's probably just some guy going to the subway as well. So we get on the train, hoping that the man would stop following us. As I'm making sure my rifle isn't bothering anyone, I didn't have space to store my Nerf rifle even when it was taken apart, so I just had it slung around my waist. I feel my girlfriend's grip on my hand tighten. Then she whispers, telling me that the man was on the train as well and was staring at us. At this point, I'd had enough of this guy's crap. I was tired and the last thing I needed was some dude stalking my girlfriend and I. Luckily, our stop was two stations away. So when we got there, we bounced right out of that car. I looked back and the man was indeed behind us. We get up to the streets, hoping that there would be at least someone or some sort of camera that would be able to see my girlfriend and I. But the streets were basically empty, with only a couple of people going back home. My girlfriend was trembling beside me, scared as all hell. I told her my plan, and with some hesitancy, she agreed to it. I stopped moving to take a drink of water, my girlfriend shifting her hand toward my leg so it wouldn't be as obvious. It was dark at the time. I felt her hand being ripped away from my leg, and I heard her terrified screams. I decided to grab the closest weapon I had on me, the stock of my Nerf rifle. The stocks attached to Nerf guns with two clips latching onto them, 
so it wouldn't take long to pull it on or off. My stock was pretty big. It wasn't metal, but it was a solid piece of plastic that could do some damage to someone's face. I whacked the guy around the face, grabbed my girlfriend's hand, and got out of there. We waved down the closest taxi, got on, and sighed, happy that we weren't being followed by some guy. I don't talk about this incident much, but I just wanted to share it and get it off my chest. Because of that incident, I stopped playing Nerf for a while. My Nerf's been stored in my Nerf armory for a couple of years, untouched. Every time I think of it, this incident comes to mind. One night shift, I was dispatched to the VA clinic. As it turned out, a juvenile was in a psychiatric appointment for hearing voices. The kid reportedly heard a pair of hatchets tell him to cut people. So, of course, the mom brought him to a doctor. During the appointment, the mother grabbed the hatchets from a bag to show the psychiatrist. As soon as she put them in view, the kid grabbed them and ran out of the building and directly into the cemetery across the street. Thankfully, I was not asked to run alongside K-9 to track this kid, but they did find him without any major incidents. I was, however, tasked with bringing the kid to the centers for evaluation, and while he was in the back of my patrol car, we distracted him with questions while another officer very subtly placed the hatchets in my trunk. It was quiet for a while on the way, and all of a sudden the kid said, Sir, you have my hatchets in the trunk, don't you? I can feel them. I didn't verbally respond, but I simply laughed a little. I have never been so freaked out by anything to this day. The centers obviously wouldn't take the hatchets. My sergeant told me not to place them into evidence, and I tried to return them to the mother and she refused to take them. I think we ultimately threw them out, but I don't really know. I just hope they never reunite with that kid ever again. About 20 years ago, in my early 20s, I was going through a really rough time. One late evening in the dark, I was smoking a cigarette on the side of the house I lived in. All of a sudden, I see hands coming over the fence, as though they were going to pull themselves up and jump over. I just assumed it was my cousin, who also lived at the house, who might have been sneaking into the house. I asked, why are you jumping the fence? Then. I see a body being pulled up over the fence. It was in the form of my cousin, but it was not her. This thing was translucent and very scary. It jumped over the fence, landed in a crouched position, and immediately flew close to the ground very fast. It literally went through me, knocked me to the ground, and then flew away. It was as though the wind had been knocked out of me. My cigarette went flying out of my hand. I immediately run into the house and see my cousin in bed, asleep. I shook her awake and said, why did you scare me like that? She asked what I was talking about and that she was asleep and had been the entire night and had never left the house. I later asked my mom why this happened and she said that sometimes when people are having a hard time, those close to them linger over them in an out of body experience to protect them. However, I don't think that's the case. This thing felt 100% evil. Has anyone else experienced this? I haven't had any negative occurrences since. This story happens in the Latin American country I was living in at the time. I was a 22 to 23 year old female finishing my master's degree in the local university. I had a part-time job as a receptionist in an institute. 
and usually I had the afternoon shift. I left work every day at about 8.30 p.m. to go to the bus stop, then walk like five minutes to get home from there. Even though this is and was one of the most dangerous countries in the world, I lived in a relatively safe city in a good neighborhood. Still, I walked very alert of my surroundings and I was ready to run and call for someone if needed. This is where my story starts. For a few days, I had been seeing this very big, expensive white SUV with tinted windows driving around my neighborhood. I'd never seen it before, but I just thought it was a new neighbor. After a few days, I started noticing that the SUV seemed to follow me. It was always parked in a corner of my street and usually started driving when I walked past it. Obviously, this gave me the creeps, so I told my boyfriend and my parents. Since the driver never did anything, just drove, not even slowly at times, they said it could be a coincidence and it could be, in fact, a neighbor. What started as nighttime encounters that went on for several weeks, but not on a regular basis, turned into daytime encounters. This SUV started to follow me around the neighborhood, sometimes passing by me fast several times in a row, sometimes slow, almost at the same speed I was walking. I discreetly took note of the license plate and always kept it in my phone, as it was a popular year model SUV. I started to look for it everywhere I went, and I noticed that they followed me to other parts of the city. This really freaked me out, and I finally contacted the police. I didn't do it before because they're mostly useless. They, of course, told me that they couldn't do anything about it unless it was physical. Otherwise, they could assume that it was just a coincidence. I was in panic mode. I even dreamed about this situation. I alerted my parents, my boyfriend who was working in another city, friends and coworkers. I even told my boss and surprisingly, she let me go in and out of work at different schedules so as to try to avoid the driver. This seemed to work for the first week and I thought it was over. Silly me, it wasn't. One morning I was going to the bakery to buy some fresh bread for lunch and there was the SUV. They started to slowly follow me. I was very anxious. I still shake just thinking about it. The only thing I was thinking was that I needed to run, but I didn't want to alert them that I knew they were following me. For context, my street was very long and on one side there were only buildings. On the other side there was a tall wall no houses, no people passing. My goal was to arrive to the little shopping center where the bakery was. But when I saw they were still following me, I knew that that wasn't a good option. They could get me on my way out. For the first time, it got confrontational. They rolled down one window and started to scream things at me. So I decided to go to my friend's office, which was on the second story of the shopping center. I quickly ran up the stairs and went into her office. I told her how they were following me and that this time I had an even worse feeling about it. She got scared also and told me to go hide in the bathroom and lock the door. A few minutes later, guess what? A chubby balding man in his 40s walked in and casually asks her about me. He said he was driving down the street when he saw his cousin entering her office. Since it had been a while since he had last seen her, me, he wanted to say hi, but she didn't hear him calling her, so he parked his car and went up to greet her. He insisted that he had seen this cousin walking inside the office, but my friend, bless her, insisted with a poker face that no one had ever entered her workplace since a few hours ago. She said later that she was shaking inside, but she wasn't going to let them get the better of her. He asked if she was sure, and she kept telling the same story over and over and insisting that there was no one there and that she was all alone. She asked him to go. All the while, I was listening to this exchange from the bathroom. When he finally left, she closed her office and told me it was safe to go out. I cried. I was petrified with fear and terror, and so was she. We immediately called the police. This time, they took me more seriously. And as I had the license plate number, 
they agreed to patrol the neighborhood on a regular basis. My friend called her boyfriend, who was a taxi driver from the company downstairs, and he took me home because my legs were shaking and I couldn't even move. From that day on, I always had someone driving me in and out of work or school, or I took taxis, something that I hadn't done before because they're expensive. I think the police presence in the area spooked him, or maybe the police found him and had a talk with him. I never knew. I never want to know either. I shiver thinking about what his intentions with me were, but the fear comes back every time I think about him. My parents still live in the area, as does my friend, but I eventually moved out of the city. First off, I just want to say that this has been ongoing for years. We were literally 13 to 14 years old when stuff started going down. I'm 18 now and I have a lot more common sense, or I would like to think so. So please try and look at this from a 13 year old's perspective and try not to judge our actions too harshly. Also, this gives more context to the adults in our lives not believing us. I have ridden horses all my life, but have never kept them close to home. When the opportunity came to keep them five minutes down the road from my house and with my best friend's ponies, I was over the moon. Little did I know what was to take place over the following years. I will start this with a backstory. The horse I owned at the time came from a rescue that I volunteered at for five years. I was sitting down one day drinking a cup of tea with the owner of the rescue center, as we usually did after a hard day of mucking out fields and dragging barrels of hay to the 40 horses and donkeys that lived there, when she told me about a farm that was just down the road from my house in a little village that we'll call Trophy. She said that her father had built that farm and that he'd be turning in his grave if he found out who owns it now. Immediately, I was intrigued, so I pushed for more info. She told me that the man who owns it now is Elliot, who is a pig farmer. He murdered his brother-in-law, who was asking him to pay back 150000 in debt. Apparently, he ground him up in a meat grinder and fed him to the pigs. He then moved those pigs two to three hours away for long enough so that when the police eventually tracked them down, any DNA would have been long out of their system. He was actually charged for murder, but ended up being acquitted by the judge due to lack of evidence. What's ironic is that he moved those pigs without a moving permit, which is illegal and suspicious as hell because moving permits are not that hard to get a hold of. So in the end, he got punished for the illegal transport of livestock and not for murder. She told me that although he was eventually found not guilty, Everyone in the village knew that he did it. Now that we've got that out of the way, we'll go back to the farm that I would be keeping my horses at. I had known the owners for a while, as I used to ride one of Annie's horses, my best friend that I mentioned earlier. Nothing particularly scary happened while I was riding for her, except once. We had decided to ride down a different trail that day, one that went past an unfamiliar farm. We didn't know who owned it and we weren't sure if they were friendly, so we proceeded with caution. All seemed fine as we were riding through the fields until the path came to a stop. There were gates and guard dogs in the way. We assumed we must have taken a wrong turn, so instead of passing through the gates, we decided to carry on through the fields and around the outskirts of the farm. Unknowingly, we were now trespassing. The horses started to feel extremely uneasy beneath us. Mine would stop and shoot forward. Annie's started backing up into the brook that ran alongside us. Annie was hanging off hers, deciding whether to throw herself off before they both ended up in the ditch when I looked toward the farm. A man was stood completely still staring at us. I honestly thought he was a scarecrow at first and I had no idea how long he'd been there. 
He disappeared after about 30 seconds of making eye contact with me. For some reason, it made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. There was something so unsettling about him. A few minutes later, we finally got the horses under control. That's when we heard gunshots behind us. Guns are illegal in my country. Only licensed owners can have them. The only reasonable explanation was that somebody was scaring birds off their crops or shooting bunnies and they hadn't seen us coming. We went into a flat out gallop. We were terrified because if they really didn't know we were there, we could have been caught by a stray bullet. All the while we were looking back to see if any birds flew to confirm our theory. They never did. That shot was meant for us, to warn us to stay away. Later that night, we looked back at the map to see where our wrong turn had been. The gates were where the trail carries on, but who in their right mind would go past a bunch of snarling guard dogs? At any point, that man could have redirected us. Shooting toward us was pretty psychopathic. We didn't tell anyone that day, as we thought we would get in trouble for trespassing. But that's only where the problems began. When I brought Eric to the farm, things calmed down. There were odd scenarios that played out. Sheep were stolen, our ponies were let out, and a white pickup truck would be seen prowling the area often. But again, nothing too serious. That was until October of that year, when we would end up riding in the dark as the days were shorter in the winter. This particular evening, we were just goofing around and laughing, like 14-year-olds do, when we heard an owl hooting. It was coming from one of the fields that the scary farmer owned. I began imitating it, joking around, and not really expecting a reply, but it did reply. I found this hilarious and Annie began joining in. This carried on for about five minutes, which in hindsight was definitely a red flag. Any owl would have stopped replying within the first two or three calls, realizing that it wasn't speaking to one of its own. This one always replied and sounded louder every few calls. The longer this went on, the less owl-like this thing sounded. There was a moment where the noise almost sounded strangled, and that was when Annie turned to me and said, that is not an owl. We realized that we had just led whoever was in that field right to us. They could now pinpoint exactly where we were. We turned our flashlights off and ducked, trying to be quiet, which is difficult when you have a 1200 pound animal squishing through the mud underneath you. We decided screw it and we galloped the rest of the field back to the farm. What we didn't realize was that the weight of the horses had left deep hoof marks in the soil, leading straight back to us. We were freaking out as we got back, but the adrenaline began to wear off and we ended up laughing about it while untacking the horses. We were about to lead them to the field when we heard the crunch of broken glass being stepped on from one of the old greenhouses opposite the stables. It was pitch black except for the dull light coming from behind us so we couldn't see anything. Immediately, we turned all the lights off, picked up a pocket knife that we used to cut hay bags open with, and hid behind the stable door. We waited for 10 minutes with no phone signal to call the police, but didn't hear a thing, scared to even breathe in case it made too loud of a sound. I decided to be brave and make a dash for the horses who were tied up outside thinking that if I could jump onto one, I could get out of there quicker than whoever I might see. My eyes had adjusted to the darkness, so I could kind of see into the greenhouse. I shouted back to Annie, there's no one here, we're just being paranoid. Again, we laughed it off, trying to shake the terror that we had just experienced. It was only the next day that it became very, very real. The next morning was hot, the ground had baked and preserved the hoof prints we left from the previous night. However, there was something else in between them. Massive boot prints leading from the field we had heard the owl in all the way back to our farm. That was where the nickname Farmer Bigfoot came about. 
We told our parents, but they decided that we were just making drama out of paranoia and didn't believe us, and that was that. These boot prints started appearing a lot. We would skate on the ice where the fields flooded over in the winter. We noticed the prints a few times, stopping on the edge of the field where we would skate, and then continuing in the opposite direction. We didn't ever see anyone watching us, though. I lost Annie's phone in the fields one night. We went looking for them in the dark. The next morning, footprints. Farmer Bigfoot footprints. Our trail started getting blocked off. First, a huge tree. I'm talking a couple hundred years worth of trunk and branches was brought down onto our trail. It was then set on fire after we cut ourselves a path through it. When we weren't being deterred, they seemed to give up. Until 2018, when huge mounds of rubble started being dumped on our trail. This time, the trail was basically inaccessible. We spoke to a man who lives on the corner, who told us that he didn't want to name the farmer who was behind all of this, but that we should report it as it is illegally blocking a bridle path. We tried to report it, but the council won't go near him because he's too scary of a man. This guy told us that we were being watched and to be careful. Now this freaked us out. But us being stupid kids, we stayed from 5 p.m. till 9 p.m. clearing a path through the rubble. We also wrote F.U. in stones just for effect. The next day, there were three more piles of rubble and our path was covered over. We were at a loss, so we decided to talk to one of the neighboring farms that keeps horses. Without telling us a name, she said, you have to be careful messing with him. Around here, he's known as the man who makes people disappear. And that's when it clicked. This whole time, we'd been messing with Elliot. Farmer Bigfoot was Elliot, the same Elliot who fed his brother-in-law to the pigs. No wonder the council wouldn't go near him. Again, we tried to tell our family, but nothing came of it because they thought we were just being dramatic. Things continued happening. Bones were left on top of the rubble piles. Again, I'm guessing this was to scare us. A whole herd of sheep were stolen. The horses kept being let out. The owners of our farm would never say who they suspected, but we all knew who it was. The white pickup would turn up almost every week. We started leaving breadcrumbs on our Snapchat stories, thinking if it was weird enough for people to screenshot, we'd have multiple witnesses if anything happened to us. We told friends that if we disappeared, make the police look at Elliot. We were terrified. It quieted down after a while, until September of last year. We had just ridden, and I was leading both horses back to the field on my own. It's down a dirt track about a two-minute walk from the stables. I walked through the wooded area on the track, and immediately this smell hit me. It was vile, and I knew what it was immediately. Death. Literal, rotting flesh. It was enough to make you gag. I put the horses out and immediately ran back to Annie to come and investigate with me. The farm owner, we'll call him Ryan, overheard me and went into the house to grab a flashlight. Annie has a weak stomach, so as soon as the smell hit her, she threw up. It was so strong and so disgusting. Ryan soon joined us and said, someone has definitely been in here. That just added to our fear. Annie had recovered from her vomiting fiasco and rejoined us in a search. Ryan then said, I really don't know what we're going to find out here, girls, but I don't think it's going to be an animal. Our fear meter was now at the max, but morbid curiosity drove us forward. After an hour of searching, we decided to unstack a pile of wooden pallets. And that's when we saw bags of white flesh. They were clear Ziploc bags. Maggots crawled inside the bags, but there were no holes, implying that whatever meat was in there had been rotting for a good while before it was cut up and put in the bags. It was the most surreal experience. After more vomit from Annie, we decided to call it a day. 
reassured that Ryan would now deal with whatever the hell this was. We assumed that he would have called the police. We got home and cried to our parents, but again, they dismissed it. How the hell are we being dramatic when we just found chunks of rotting flesh in the woods? Anyway, Ryan is hands down one of the loveliest men on the planet. We always felt safe around him. But what we found out days later was extremely questionable. He didn't call the police. He buried the meat. He didn't throw it out. He buried it. What the fuck? We assume now that it's because he's old and vulnerable and he didn't want to get involved in anything that might put him or his family at risk. I still have no idea why Annie and I didn't phone the police. I'm guessing because we didn't want to cause trouble for Ryan. And no one else believed us, so why would the police? This is unfortunately, I guess, where my story concludes. I know, how unsatisfying. I'm no longer at the farm, but I still have horses. My parents now believe everything I told them. I think maybe because I've kept telling them for the past five years. In hindsight, they wonder why the hell they didn't move the horses out of there. Annie and I are still best friends, and we reminisce from time to time about how we were stalked by a murdering farmer for nearly three years. We will never know what that meat was, or if Elliot had anything to do with it nor will we know why he followed us all those years, trying to stop us from riding down our very own bridal path. But honestly, I'm not sure I want to know. Back when I was a captain in the fire department, we responded to a house fire early in the morning. When we arrived, the roof was breached and flames had taken out two windows on the second floor of a split-level home. We made entry, and even though the roof was breached, the thermocline was about two feet off the first floor. We wouldn't have gone in at all, but a child was missing, and the father and mother had gotten out of the house, but they couldn't get to their daughter's room. The father was being treated for burns on his hands and forearms as he had tried to go in after her. Suffice to say, they were frantic. They told us that her room was on the second floor, second door to the right. Simple enough. We made entry and the stairs faced the door. Rapid bursts from the TFT to the ceiling brought the smoke level up to about four feet from the floor. That's when my handline man and I saw something that neither of us could explain. I saw motion to my left, down on the main floor. Somebody was walking around downstairs. I pointed to my handline man and he saw it too. We couldn't see a body as the person was in the smoke, but we could see the legs and the feet clearly. It looked to be a man wearing olive green trousers and leather shoes. I wouldn't say that the legs were dancing, but they were certainly moving in a way to get our attention. We redirect back down the stairs and see the legs go into a door on the right side of the small hallway. We both saw the legs go into that room. We get down the hallway and the door is closed. Feeling the door, there weren't flames behind it, so we made entry to discover that we were in a bathroom. The light was on, and curled up in the bathtub was the little girl. There was no one else in the room with her. We broke out the window and got her to a second crew, keeping the house next door from catching on fire. We looked around the bathroom again and couldn't find the man that we had both seen going into the bathroom. There was nowhere for him to hide in there. We withdrew from the house and did exposure control as the house was a complete loss with the fire already ingressing into the living room. The parents had gone with their daughter to the hospital where she was checked and cleared to go later that morning. The man had suffered only first and small second degree burns on his hands and forearms. The family stopped by the station and wanted to thank us for saving their daughter. They asked us how we knew to check the first floor bathroom. 
and I asked them if they knew anything about a man in olive green trousers and leather shoes. The man pulled out his phone after a minute of thinking and showed us a picture of two old men standing on a lawn. One of the men was clearly wearing olive green trousers and those same leather shoes. The man that we had seen on the first floor had passed away in 1976 and it was the man's father. The little girl's grandfather had showed us where she was. We were all speechless. It's the only time that I've ever seen a ghost during a response, but I will never forget it. When I was 15, I traveled to Europe with my family. We stayed in Ital, Germany, in a small inn for a few nights. My parents had a double bed on the second floor. My sisters had the double bedroom next to theirs, and I was lucky enough to have a single room all to myself at the far end of the hall. When we went to check into our rooms, as soon as I entered the hallway, I remember almost feeling as though I had walked into a wall of sorts, of bad energy. I just felt so unnerved and uneasy in that hallway, but I passed it off as an overactive imagination. I slept the first night without any issues, other than waking up a few times. The next morning at breakfast, one of my sisters mentioned feeling really uncomfortable in the hallway, almost as if the air was crushing her. It unnerved me even more that I wasn't the only one who felt weirded out. Plus, she was an adult at the time, so it further cemented in my head that the wing of the hotel was odd at least. Later that night, I'm sleeping peacefully, when at about 2 a.m., I'm awoken by something ripping the covers off of me and being jerked about two feet toward the end of the bed by my ankles. At first, I thought somebody had broken into my room, because when I turned toward what had grabbed me, a huge looming dark shape was visible. It was darker than the darkness. It was like a man was in my room. I frantically flipped on the light, only to find that absolutely nothing was there. The window was locked from the inside. There was nobody in the closet or in the bathroom, and my room was also still locked from the inside. I stayed up the rest of the night, scared, playing on my DS. The next morning, we're at breakfast, and my sister mentions that she was up half the night because she thought she saw a person silhouetted against the wall of the room. But when she turned the light on, there was nobody there. It was just such a bizarre and creepy experience. We checked out that day, so I didn't get to experience anything after that. But I think I'm all right with that, because it still freaks me out to this day. This story happened three years ago when I was 15. It happened in my village. I don't tell this story much because people tend to think that I'm making it up, but I've been thinking of it quite a lot this week and I just wanted to share it. My village is located in a rural area that is protected by the government because it has been considered a natural paradise for the last 30 years. This means that exploration in this area is quite difficult nowadays since it is forbidden to cut trees, which means that it is a huge forest. I was spending my summer there, and my favorite thing was to go hiking, although I had never gone into the woods alone, just on roads with people. My grandma had told me the cleaning services had opened and rehabilitated a path that had been covered in bushes and trees for the last 30 years because of a race that was being prepared, like runners and stuff. Usually I'd go to the nearest town about an hour away on foot by the only way that I knew, the road. On my way back from seeing friends there, I took the new path that my granny told me was safe. I went alone. That was a mistake. 
The first part of the path was the easiest, just too many obstacles and landslides, but it was nothing compared to the rest. The second part was a hill full of rocks that was the hardest thing to go up. Literally, I had to climb up on my arms and legs like a dog. When I got to the top, I looked around and found some animal bones. I didn't pay much attention to it since the area is known for its big population of wolves and bears that go out at night. I continued my way faster than before. This part was plain floor, where the woods really begin, so it was a relief when I got to a dead end. Some huge trees had fallen exactly on a row on the path, and it was impossible to cross them. This seemed really off to me, because there were no other fallen trees. The weirdest part? Beside those trees, there was this little barn. Yes, a barn in the middle of the woods. I thought to myself that it was probably abandoned. It looked like it. So I decided to throw my bag into the little field that belonged to the barn, and I crossed the fence. I crossed it running without realizing the most bizarre thing. The field had no trees. It was clear. No bushes, no big plants, nothing. It really shouldn't be like that if it was abandoned, and nobody had been able to cut anything down there for years. I started feeling concerned about how the location of the fallen trees was so coincidental, how there casually was this barn beside a clear field when the path had been closed for 30 years. It just seemed really off. I went on and luckily I was reaching the last hill that my grandma had described, the one that connected with the village. Suddenly there was a moment of silence in the woods absolute silence, which allowed me to hear some branches cracking behind me. I thought to myself it was probably a bird or something, but they came closer and they sounded like footsteps. After trying to convince myself it was probably just an animal, I was way too afraid to look back, I started walking faster. And guess what? So did the footsteps. I just took off running after I noticed that, and so did the footsteps. At this point, I was running for my life. Suddenly, I started to hear incredibly loud grunts. Everything was going really fast. Luckily, I got to my village in a minute or so after that. I got onto the patio of the first house I found and closed the door. It was a relative's house, no need to call the police. I stayed there for 10 minutes until I got my breath back and then I went home. I get chills just from remembering the place, not having a signal in the middle of nowhere. And the grunts. It makes me think there was something following me since the barn and the trees were just a distraction to slow me down. I never went into the woods alone after that. The last two days have gotten crazy. For the past two years, there's been a tapping sound coming from my bedroom window. It started one Halloween night. I know, it sounds like a bad movie, but bear with me. And it's happened about a few times a month since, sometimes more often. Something taps at the window. There is nothing around to hit the window, and it sounds exactly like a finger tapping on the glass. My siblings and I are just used to it by now. A few days ago, my brother started complaining that something was communicating to him from outside the den window. Keep in mind, we live in an apartment complex, so we always have the blinds closed. He says that whatever it was just kept saying, hello, to him in a robotic, high-pitched voice. The rest of our family just shrugged it off. The day after, we go outside and there are small tracks leading up to all of our windows. I don't know what animal could have made those tracks because it's bipedal. Later that day, I was in my bedroom, laying in the bed that's next to the window, blinds closed, and I about jump out of my skin because someone is loudly banging against the glass. I ignored it. I just assumed it was one of my siblings sneaking up on me. 
I then found out that they were both together at that moment in the house while it happened and they hadn't been out for hours. The next night, my brother complained about the voice outside his window again, and we told him to ignore it. If it's something supernatural, we don't want to mess with it. Yesterday, while we were all preparing for dinner, my entire family and I heard the creature screaming outside. I was too shocked to move to grab my phone and record it. It kept yelling, Hello, come out! Hello, come out! Exactly how my brother had described. It was so loud we could hear it clearly from the kitchen and the dining room and really the whole house. We didn't want to look outside. This morning, more snow had fallen, but fresh prints were there. I don't know what to make of any of this, but it's impossible for this to be a prank because of the lack of human prints in the snow. I live in Northeast Ohio. If anyone has any information on what this is or has a similar experience, please let me know. I'm telling this story to maybe get some help in identifying what I saw, because I've been trying to figure it out for three years. I was a U.S. Marine from 2014 to 2019. I deployed to the Philippines to help out some joint operations. It was right after the siege of Marawi. Basically all we did was stare at the top of the jungle canopy looking for heat signals, and then communicating fire missions for artillery. We were about three months into the deployment, and like four hours into this mission, staring at absolutely nothing. We were over the mountains of Basilon, with really thick jungle canopy. Even with infrared, it's really hard to see anything out there. It was like trying to find needles in a haystack with Vaseline in your eyes. But when something's above the canopy, like a helicopter, birds, or monkeys in the trees, it pops up, and you can really get some good definition depending on how good the camera operator is, and atmospherics, of course. I was the camera guy, and I was just chilling, staring into the void while my pilot burned circles into the sky for hours. I asked my officer in charge of the flight if I could go smoke while the pilot took over the camera after I locked on to a geopoint to keep the camera from going all over the place, and he said yes. So I go smoke, and not a minute later, I hear the guy inside flying go, uh, hey dude, you should get back in here and look at this. So I go back inside all pissed off because I hadn't got to finish my cigarette, but then I see what my pilot had locked the camera onto. I hopped back into my seat, and I took back control. I was like, all right, is it cows or Isis? But it's none of those things. It's just flying above the canopy at a pretty good clip, flapping and gliding on what I can only assume are very large pointed wings. At this point, it's just a very dark shape moving over the canopy until I clean up the infrared image and start to pick out more. At first I'm like, dude, it's just a really big bird. But then I see like a rounded head at the front and a small space in between what I assumed was the tail, making me think it had some kind of legs. The detail wasn't amazing, but you could make out general shapes. If I have a good day for atmospherics and light and altitude, I can tell an RPG from an AK-47 if I'm lucky that kind of detail. Then my smart, college-educated officer is like, check the measuring tool. It looks kind of big. We have a tool that uses geodata, altitude, and the aircraft's position, allowing you to use the laser and the program to let you know how far a distance is between two points. We mostly use it to measure buildings and artillery shot distances. But given what we had in the height of the canopy, I didn't see why it wouldn't work for this too. So I take a screen cap of my cam and I send it to my pilot to work on while I'm still on lock. He does the math and he comes up with a roughly 6 foot length and a 17 foot wingspan. 
as I watched it fly, I just kept thinking, that looks like a bat. Just the way that it flapped and moved and the general shape. It wasn't a bird, and its wings definitely came out at like an angle and stretched, you know, just like a bat. But there's no bat that big. The crew and I talked about it, passed it up to hire, but eventually we had to actually go do our jobs instead of become amateur zoologists. But after that flight, I just couldn't shake that feeling or place what it was. The other thing was that right next to our smoke pit, when we're not flying the drones, there's this thing that's absolutely filled with fruit bats and it glows in infrared. This thing didn't. So my pilot and I got curious and we started asking the local people and contractors who worked at the chow hall and at the PX. A bunch of them laughed and told us that it was because we stay up too late and we work too long on night shift. But a couple of the older ones told us about an oswang or a tik tik. Sometimes people call it a mananangal. Apparently it's this big old flying thing that eats babies. But in an effort to disprove giant baby-eating women man bats, can somebody please tell me what I saw? Because I would much rather my spicy PTSD just be regular PTSD. About eight years ago, when I was 13, I was up until 3 a.m. playing Xbox online, as you do. I remember feeling a little peckish and I wanted some late night cereal. So I finished my game and went to go grab something to munch on. I turned on the hall lights and checked on my little brother, who was nine at the time, and my little sister, who was five. Being the oldest sibling, it was just something I would do. They were both fast asleep. As I got to the top of the staircase, I started to hear a little girl talking to herself. It completely creeped me out, but I thought maybe it was my sister sleep talking. But then it was even clearer, and I could really hear the sound of this girl's voice, and it was not my sister. I heard the voice coming from downstairs, and I got this horrible, sickening feeling inside my stomach. I got on my knees on the top of the staircase, and put my head down the stairs a little to hear the voice clearer. Then I figured that the voice was coming from the kitchen. Maybe she sensed I was there because after that, when I tried to hear her even clearer, she laughed and I heard footsteps run off. I absolutely freaked out and ran into my mom and dad's room telling them what had happened, but they both just told me to go back to bed. Needless to say, I did not get that bowl of cereal or sleep much that night. It was only a few weeks ago, now that I'm 21, that my mom has told me about the little girl who lives in our house. She says she feels her presence every now and then, mainly at the bottom of the stairs, which makes sense as our two dogs now and our old dog used to stare up the staircase at nothing and sometimes bark like crazy. To this day, when I watch TV, I sometimes feel her looking at me from the stairs, although I've never heard or experienced anything quite like I did when I was younger. I'm not a believer in the paranormal, and to be honest, I'm still very skeptical. But I'll share my experience anyway, because maybe it could provide some answers. I visited the Castle Museum in York, England. I specifically went there for a birthday trip. And me, being somebody who's obsessed with history, it was a no-brainer going there. The museum was fantastic, and I had a great time going through all the different floors and rooms it contained. About an hour in, we came across the prison section of the museum. Now this wasn't a huge prison, more like a dungeon than anything else. There were maybe about four cells on either side, all open for the public to wander inside and look around. 
Each cell was brightly lit enough to see where you were going, except for one. On the very far left side was a cell that had no lights, no furniture, no bed or tables or windows, nothing. It was pitch black and empty. So I decided that as a challenge, I would go inside and stay there for about 10 seconds. About five seconds in, I felt somebody go right up to my ear and whisper something. Unfortunately, I never made out what it said because I instantly panicked and ran out of the cell. Now my first thought afterward was maybe there was a speaker hidden inside the room, playing sounds to scare people. But unless the speaker was really just right next to my ear, I don't see how that was possible. My second thought was maybe a mischievous staff member or tourist decided to hide and scare us. But again, I would have had to have felt somebody leaning against me for how close it was in there. Sadly, I didn't ask a receptionist or anyone who worked there about that cell, or if there were any other reported experiences. I really wish I had. But I did do some research, and I found many stories and even some photographic evidence of paranormal encounters inside that prison section. So, either the darkness got to my head and I imagined it, or I am in fact another person to make contact with one of the restless souls who still wanders the museum. When I was younger, in about the fourth grade, I lived in Germany. My father was in the military, so we lived on the military base. And that is where I met my best friend at the time. Let's just call her MK. MK and I's parents noticed that we would always play together and we would have play dates. Eventually, MK and I brought our families together and we would all hang out. MK had two older sisters and a little brother, while I have an older and a younger brother. MK and her family lived off base in the local part of Germany so they lived amongst the non-English speaking, well, German people. Of course, the house MK lived in was old, really old. I would stay the night over there all the time. One night, for some reason that I can't remember, MK and I decided to sleep on the floor in the bedroom that she shared with the second oldest sister. Let's call her B. B was in the room with the oldest sister and let MK and I have the other bedroom to ourselves. So anyway, this night, we're sleeping on the floor a few feet away from their beds. I remember waking up in the middle of the night to the only light coming from the hallway. The door was open. My vision was blurry and kind of kept going in and out. I remember looking up at MK's bed and on it, there sat a woman I knew she was from the older times because she wore all black and she had one of those bulky dresses and a black veil over her face. The way she was sitting, her peripheral vision would have been toward me. She sat up straight, both legs together, hands in her lap as though she was in church. I guess she felt me look at her because she slowly started turning her head toward me. I remember at that moment that I wasn't scared, but everything felt sad. The energy was sad. Her face looked sad. She already looked as if she was at a funeral. Anyway, as soon as her face got all the way around to look at me, my vision went black. And the next thing I remember is waking up in the morning. I told MK and her sister about it, but I think they didn't want to believe me. I also think, though, that something told them I wasn't joking. I went back over there a few more times because that woman, although creepy, didn't make me feel unsafe. And to this day, I've always wondered what her story was. I 
I had to do my practice in my school as a librarian for three months. Every morning, I used to sweep and mop the library floor and then start to arrange the books on the shelves. Then I would key in all of the new book entries on the computer. I had the habit of bringing a bottle of holy water with me, and I would place it on the table where I sit. Since it was the major exam month, the library would be lonely, as the students and the teachers would be going back from school to their houses after one paper that day. Only some students and teachers would come to the library to study and borrow books. Most of the time, though, I would be alone in the library, so I would play some music as I arranged the books on the shelves. One day, as I was taking the log books out from the drawer, I accidentally spilled some holy water on the floor. To my shock, that area started to smoke a little. Although it was hard to see with the naked eye, I sensed that something was amiss in the library that day. As soon as I got up, in shock, the media room doorknob behind me started to twist and turn frantically. I stood in my place and looked over the counter to check if someone was there. I saw a shadow at the bottom of the door. I rushed out of the library and walked over to the media room, which was just next door to the library, and turned the doorknob slowly. It was locked. No one could have been in there. So whose shadow did I see? I've always been able to see, hear, feel, and communicate with spirits, but this particular one, during my Christmas travels, specifically spooked me. It's rare that I see people while I'm driving, but this thing looked blue. I don't know, like he had a blue light to him, and it was a man that was approximately 5'10", and I'd say around 150 to 170 pounds. I saw him on the side of the road going southbound on I-95 in Brevard County, Florida. He had on these loose, very worn out Levi's and work boots. He was wearing a trucker cap and a loose t-shirt that I think may have been like a deep burnt sienna or a light brown. It was hard to tell because of that blue glow. He had brown hair and brown eyes and a brown goatee. Does anyone happen to know of anything that happened in the area with a man who matches this description? I just want to know who this is. This happened to me when I was in my teens. For obvious reasons, I won't give my hometown's name, but it's located in Wisconsin. When I was 16, two buddies of mine from high school, we'll call them R and T, told me about a cemetery that didn't have any headstones out by the lake. I'm a nut when it comes to anything creepy or unsettling, so immediately, I was in. They were excited that they had actually convinced me to come with them. I was heavily depressed at the time and kept to myself, so it was rare that I got out. After school got out, R drove us to this supposed cemetery. It was nearing summer break, so it was a warm day. And where I live, warm days mean there are creatures out everywhere. We almost crushed a little turtle family on our way there but we made a detour to pick them up and get them off the road so no one else would. The turtles are okay. This hopefully shows you that there is indeed wildlife out and about in this area. Now, one thing about this cemetery is that it was essentially in the middle of nowhere. There was a small park with nature trails around it, leading to some pretty lovely sitting areas, stuff like that. There was an old army reserve training course to the east and farther to the northwest was the mental hospital for the criminally insane. When you first come to this place, there's a boat launch where the ferry used to go back and forth across the lake to the city directly opposite us. The thing is, 
this place was off the beaten path. You had to go down a marked trail for about 50 feet before taking a sharp right through the underbrush and marshland. When we got there, there was a chain link fence and what I thought at first was an empty soccer field. It was eerie to say the least. R turns to me and his voice takes on a serious tone. Okay, he says. So before we go in there, there's a couple things you should know. One, do not go to the back right corner. And two, if you hear someone talk to you, do not turn around and leave immediately. I really didn't think a whole lot of this warning, mostly because R had a penchant for being overly dramatic about a lot of things. So I just agreed. I was eager to get inside the fence and see what this place was all about. As soon as I stepped across the threshold, everything went dead silent. I mean, legitimately everything. No birds sang, no crickets chirped. There weren't even mosquitoes in that place. It really threw me for a loop. My stomach sank immediately, but I didn't want to seem like a chicken. So I didn't say anything. I just looked around. T was a photography student, so he started to take pictures of the trees and everything around us. R followed him for most of the time, while I went off on my own. I was kind of just wandering at this point, but I stopped when my foot sank down farther than expected. At first, I thought I'd just fallen into a critter den or something. I was wrong. Under my foot was a round stone disc covered in lichens and moss. I could barely make out the numbers 103 etched into it. My heart was in my throat and a chill shot down my spine like somebody had dropped an icicle through my skull. I suddenly got that horrible feeling. That kind of feeling when you find yourself somewhere that you don't belong. I was also a stupid teen and curiosity got the better of me. I walked the length of the field, finding more round stones with numbers on them, all worn and weathered from age. I felt sick. When I looked up, I noticed something and I was shocked that I hadn't noticed it before. Across from me, to my right, there was a sort of sitting area with an American flag hanging limply on its mast and a massive boulder with a carved base. I went over to look at it and found an inscription, which did nothing at all to ease my anxiety. It said, quote, This monument is dedicated to the 675 unnamed souls interned here. Amongst their number are doctors, nurses, and patients who were claimed during the epidemic. I don't remember the name of it, as well as Civil War soldiers who fought for the Union. I was freaked. 675? It hit me that this wasn't just an unmarked cemetery. It was full-on mass graves, if the numbered stones were anything to go by. I ran at a full tilt back to where the guys were hanging out, hyperventilating and saying that I wasn't okay to be here anymore. They gave me crap for being a baby, but I told them that I would happily walk home if they were going to be jerks about it. I wasn't comfortable walking across literal pits of bodies. I guess that convinced them because they agreed and we started to walk back the way we came. That's when I heard her voice. Behind us, maybe 15 feet or so, a woman cried out to us. It was the saddest, most desperately lonely sounding voice I have ever heard in my life. It was only a statement, but it froze me stone still. She just said, don't go. I didn't even breathe. R and T didn't turn around, but they did tell me to double time it back to the car. I don't remember running. I do remember the sudden blast of heat from the car door letting out the heat it had collected under the sun. We were gone in record time. The weirdest thing about it though, I couldn't stop crying. I full on sobbed for at least a half an hour after we'd gotten out of there, like the kind of crying you would do at a funeral. 
I was so sad, and I didn't understand why. But I couldn't shake it until we parked at a McDonald's and the guys handed me a bottle of water. I asked them if they had heard what I did when I had finally calmed down enough to speak. They said that they did, and they were glad I was okay. I don't know who that was. She sounded like the loneliest woman to ever have existed. I could hear the tears in her voice before I even registered what she'd said. I wished I could know her name, but when she was one in 675, the odds were against me. What I do know, however, is that we were the only people in the park when we got there, and the only people there when we left. I refuse to ever go back to that place. During my time at university, I had a part-time job at a huge Bavarian company. The building had eight floors and a quadratic shape with a big lobby hall in the center of the building. It actually was hundreds of years old, but completely renovated. I worked once or twice a week, mainly on weekends. Now here's the interesting part. I worked in night shifts, and my job was basically to walk around the whole building twice a night. While walking through the hallways, I just had to watch out for stuff that people forgot when they rushed into the weekend open doors, open windows, light switches, things like that. Nothing out of the ordinary, and the payment was also really good. In fact, I was kind of surprised about how good the payment was, because obviously I didn't have to do much in those eight hours. My girlfriend and other friends mentioned that the payment is just fair, as I had to walk around a huge building at night, completely alone. They always mentioned how they would never do this, Sometimes my girlfriend would visit me there to bring me dinner. They said that the sinister feeling in buildings like these would play mind games with them. I never had problems being alone. Neither was I paranoid, nor did I believe in paranormal occurrences. Just studied throughout the night and did my two walks. Until this one night in September of 2018. The shift started like any other. I got the keys from the janitor and started studying after my first walk through the building. Between 3.55 and 4.05 a.m., the whole electronic system throughout the entire building resets, which I found really odd at my first shift but grew to ignore it after some months. The janitor explained the reason after I asked. The reset leads to light sources turning on and off throughout the whole building, systematically but still chaotic. I sat at the front desk, not even paying attention to it, when suddenly a certain noise reached me. One of the two elevator doors in the first floor opened itself, closed itself, and then opened itself again. Meh, malfunction, I thought, going back to reading boring scientific papers. After 20 minutes, it happened again, but this time, the light in the elevator switched off, which seemed really odd. At this point, I started to feel a little bit alarmed. When I moved into the elevator, the door behind me closed. I panicked and tried to get out of the elevator, but the elevator even started to take me to the second floor in complete darkness. When I reached the second floor, the door opened and I basically fell out of the elevator door, turning around while I fell. The really sinister looking, completely dark elevator closed again and took off to another floor. My heart was racing and a part of me thought someone manipulated the console, but another part of me felt something else. Fear. I had goosebumps all over my body and I returned to the front desk with a plan to text my supervisor and the janitor about a technical defect in the elevator. I did this with trembling hands when I suddenly heard another distant noise, radio music from somewhere in the canteen. I slowly moved to the canteen with my smartphone light switched on. The noise came from the kitchen and I followed it. 
Reaching the kitchen, I saw that a radio was playing music on some of the tables. The cooks listened to the radio while working. I froze and I couldn't breathe. During my first walk, the janitor texted me and told me to put the radio under a certain desk and switch it off, as the cooks would always store it there. I did this directly when I started the shift, even texting him to confirm that I had and to ask where the desk was because at first I couldn't find it. I turned around and sprinted through the canteen directly to an exit and waited outside for the last two hours. Luckily, I had the keys with me when someone for the day shift came. When he arrived, I got into the building with him, took my bag and left quickly. I called myself in sick for the next two weeks. After that, I quit the job using excuses regarding my sleep cycle. Till this day, I have no idea what happened that night. Back in October of 1989, my mother and I went up to the western part of North Carolina for a week to see the leaves change color. We rented a cabin which was owned by the cousin of my brother's former high school band teacher who had retired several years earlier. The band director was more or less keeping watch over the place. He lived down the street, but it wasn't until Friday afternoon that we saw him. The cabin was somewhat in the wilderness, but it was near a main road. The band director had to go away for the weekend and was letting us know. We had the number of his cousin in case we needed any help. That was on a Friday afternoon. Up until that time, the trip had been uneventful. Friday evening, we went to a church dinner, which was down the road. When we came back home, it was already dark. My mom started thinking that we were the only ones on this road and that we didn't know where the nearest neighbor was, and that was unsettling to her. The moon wasn't full, but there was a light to it. We had separate rooms inside the cabin. The power went out in the cabin shortly after we came home from the church dinner. Then, my mother heard what sounded like footsteps, and she saw what looked like an outline of a hat through the window. There was a man walking around near the cabin, then we saw this hat disappear into the woods. By this time, both of us were together and terrified. We thought that this man was going to come into the cabin and harm us. Both of us wondered if he had cut the power source. I decided to sleep in the bed that was in my mother's room. We tried to sleep and then were awakened by an owl hooting. My mom could see the owl's eyes, which were looking into the window. The drape couldn't be closed the entire way. The owl didn't take its eyes off my mom the entire night, and it hooted all night long too. My mother tried to ignore the owl, but its presence really unnerved her. The eyes really unnerved me. Neither of us could sleep. Every noise jarred us awake. It would be like, what's that? Did you hear that? Every once in a while, we would see the outline of that hat walking around the general area, and then it would go off into the woods. Both of us were freaked out by this point, but we also weren't about to leave in the middle of the night. There was no phone in the cabin, and this was long before cell phones were common. The power finally did come back on several hours later, or so it seemed. We were in the wee hours of the morning at that point. Originally, we were going to leave on Sunday, but we left as soon as the sun came up on Saturday. A couple of days later, my mother got a call from the band director. Apparently, the man that we had seen was a mountain man who was a handyman who had been trying to get the power back on for us. He was harmless, but neither the band director or his cousin had told us that he lived out in the woods. Had we known this, we wouldn't have left on Saturday. He was the one that had told the band director that we left a day early. We can laugh about it now. It was a memorable night. That owl still freaks me out, though.